The Peoria City Council meeting will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Finn. Here. Councilmember Patena. Here. Councilmember Binsbacher. Here. Councilmember Edwards. Here. Councilmember Hunt. Here. Councilmember Dunn. Here. Council Liaison Greathouse. Here. And Council Liaison Robin John. Here. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of February 18th, 2020. Uh, we have one item on our study session agenda this evening, and it is Parks, Recreation, and Community Facilities Department Update. And I will turn it over to our city manager, Jeff Tyne. Great. Thank you, Mayor, and appreciate this council the opportunity to go through a very substantial department, uh, Parks, Recreation, Library Facilities, Community Facilities Department. It really is uh, one that, that serves so many of our citizens. This is really an opportunity for our staff to really discuss all of their different operations, but also talk a little bit about uh, what do they see as some opportunities and challenges that are coming up in the upcoming year and really is good in preparation of our fiscal year 2021 budget process that, uh, that is upcoming. So with that, I'll pass it over to Deputy City Manager Eric Strunk to make some introductions. Sure, absolutely. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Jeff. Good evening, Mayor and Council. It's kind of hard to believe it's been almost a year, I think, since we were last in front of you. And the focus last year, as you recall, was more or less on our patronage at our recreation programs and some of the considerations with respect to revenue and fees. And we are constantly monitoring that. Um, but there's another very important element that we'd like to spend some time with you on this evening. And I've got two great presenters to my immediate left, to your right, on John Sefton, our director, and Chris Calcaterra, our deputy director. Um, we also have a couple of content experts in the audience tonight. I think Blake is here, Blake Englert, and um, Nathaniel Washburn is here as well. And the focus tonight really is to go through, we hope to show you kind of more of a visual tour. Yep, there's some points on the slides you'll see. But the most important thing as always is to collect your thoughts and input um, at certain pause points. So. We'll go through um, a little bit of it uh, is rudimentary, you know that, um, but it's important that those who are watching for the first time um, get a feel for the structure and what guides us. But after that, there's a lot of really cool slides, I like to say, and some really good points that we'll share with you. And as always, the challenges uh, interact with us. Let us know um, concerns, issues, challenges. We'll do our best to hit on what we think is occurring in, in the profession and it will hopefully set the path for a, a successful fiscal year 21 and points beyond. So with that, I'll turn it over to John, and John and Chris will take the lion's share of the narrative this evening. Thank Great. you. Thank you, Eric, Jeff, and Mayor, Council. Thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, also, uh, while we mentioned some of the key staff that are in the audience, I'd like to call out Mr. Jerry Johnson, our newly elected chairman of the Parks, Recreation, and Community Facilities Board. So we thank him for his community service and taking on the leadership role with our team. So with that, um, we're gonna jump into our, our four key areas, uh, real highlight here, and then as Eric had mentioned, a lot of opportunity for you to uh, interject, ask questions, uh, give us direction, and uh, so forth. So it's not a, not a deep, deep dive into the department without, without talking about our mission. Uh, to meet the needs of the citizens of Peoria by developing, implementing, maintaining quality programs, services, events, and facilities that are cost-effective, creative, and responsive to citizen input. We are strategically guided by a community services master plan, and we're also a CAPRA accredited agency. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in the future here. And uh, pretty significant, 95,000 plus annual registrations in our programs. We uh, are very uh, fortunate to have uh, not only our registered programs where we're instructor-led or program-led, but we have a number of passive opportunities, our trails and our parks, the neighborhoods. It's really an integrated system and recreation matters to each and every one of us. We wanna highlight the fact that our, uh, we're not successful without our partnerships. Uh, the way that we work with our advisory boards, uh, the commissions, the local businesses, the not-for-profits, and all our other city agencies Parks and Recreation is fundamental to what we do. We believe that through the livability goals that, are, that we're working on, uh, that Parks and Recreation has an interject to every single one of them. Our vision, enriching the livability of Peoria through a connection to community places and programs. This fancy layout is gonna give us a bit of a vision as to where we are and how we are structured. 
Uh, we're in essence four operating divisions working through the overall vision of enriching life in Peoria through our extraordinary advisory boards and you. As I mentioned, I'm gonna talk a little bit about our master plan approved by Marin Council in 2014. Uh, the system contains elements that you see listed here. It is and was intended to be a 10 year master plan. So we're at about year six. And with that, um, we've got some opportunities to check into some elements. Uh, we are working with ASU. Uh, in fact, last fall, uh, the Project Cities team did the asset inventory, a recreation asset inventory from across the city, who, how, and where are recreation businesses, whether it's the pottery group or sports teams, they've helped us create a massive database that complements what we do as a city. And moving forward, we're looking to establish an agreement with uh, ASU uh, to engage our next citizen survey. And operationally, uh, the, the plan gave us our focus areas, all of which you see there, and uh, have been re and do remain very relevant. I mentioned that uh, being a CAPRA accredited agency, we are just one of 172 nationwide. It's grown over the years, uh, but uh, we meet 151 standards in these 10 sections. And just like our police, fire, and public works departments, uh, we strive to be a cut above and to uh, be able to demonstrate to our community how we serve them in efficient and effective ways. We are actually up for our reaccreditation just last week, we submitted our self-assessment, uh, which is a very large, I think it was about 600 pages of evidence and, uh, and statement about our uh, a level of service in these 10 different areas. So it's a, a lot of work. I wanna call out our business services team, Maria Calcaterra and her folks that have been instrumental in helping us package all of that together. We do expect our visiting, visiting team, so our professionals, three professionals from across the country are gonna come and visit us end of April. So hope to get a chance to meet with all of you during that time too. So let's jump into the operation. Uh, we'll start with the business services division, again, led by Maria Calcaterra. She and her team uh, lead the administrative functions for both parks and recreation and the neighborhood and human services departments. Uh, on top of this, all of the work with accreditation. You can see there that it's a sizable uh, budget for just one of us. You put us both together and it's a lot of work. Uh, and if you spend like uh, some people do, they're worth keeping an eye on. So uh, the teams uh, really work hard at uh, making sure that from a human resource standpoint, uh, the budgeting, the financing, drilling down and working with the business services team to make sure that we're doing all the right things. And of course, in partnership with our other city departments, budget and finance and the key teams there. So when we talk about our objectives um, and opportunities, uh, we really are focused on revenues, on everything from our fee programs to our sponsorships and other areas. We had a tremendous uh, effort put into the ADP and the when, when to work integration. So utilizing technology, Perfect Mind is our customer service piece that is our frontline software system that allows people to register and reserve our recreation amenities. And as I mentioned, the accreditation and CAPRA review. Uh, effective marketing and sales, it doesn't stop. Uh, when we think about the challenges moving forward, uh, really focusing on our assets and how we communicate that to the people that are here today and those that keep showing up every day in our growing community. Our facility and program fees, uh, staff recruitment and retention, you're gonna, you're gonna hear this as a theme throughout the night. Uh, it's probably one of our biggest challenges. Um, there's a lot of reasons, but it's a great job market right now. So with that, any thoughts uh, from your perspectives? Council? Nope, go Excellent. ahead, go on. So we'll jump right into libraries. Okay. Again, pretty impressive. I understand that this uh, new logo, 100 years, is Nathaniel's new tattoo. And uh, if anybody else wants one, we've got uh, Explore, uh, Explore the Library or uh, Bravo Peoria coming up. Uh, we've got over, as a system, over 1.8 million in circulation last year, over 550,000 visits over 40,000 uh, program attendances. We have access to the Greater, Physical Di Greater Phoenix Digital Library. Uh, we have technology resources like FreeGal and Hoopla. Uh, we've even implemented a seed library. You can check out seeds, plant it, and not have to make, make a return. 
The uh, other really hot spot that we wanted to uh, recognize is the free Wi-Fi hotspots that people can check out. You know, realize how important the connection is to the internet, whether you're searching for a job or searching for knowledge. Uh, that has been one really big hit. Our team, our librarians submitted a grant and acquired a good number of those, and we'd like to see that program expand as well. We've also implemented Explore to Go kits. These are science kits that parents can check out, or group leaders, uh, Girl Scouts can check out these Explore science kits and help to facilitate learning and uh, lifelong learning. So with our new objectives and achievements, uh, one of the positions that we've been able to create with current, re current resources are new enrichment coordinator. Uh, we had a retirement from the leisure class or the special interest class area that was a 20-hour part-time position. We've merged that with a library position, put it out for recruitment, had about 170 plus applicants. So Nathaniel and the team are vetting those now. Uh, we're very excited to get that position on and will be a merged full-time position working on the leisure class uh, programming as well as the outreach of the community or library services. The um, main library is under renovation we have the Willow Room that is under current uh, construction. They were chipping out concrete just today. Uh, it's been a long process. And again, broken record, but construction is always a challenge. Uh, but uh, just today, we had another meeting with the engineering team. They're working on getting that going and, and making it look very good. A lot of good feedback from our users as well. And look forward for, you, for you, your guys' input as we go through the process. John, before you yep. move on from this, um, I just want to ask a question that, that I want other people to hear the answer to. I know that a lot of people think that libraries, now that there's so much digital media out there, um, libraries aren't as relevant as they used to be. But my understanding is that even though it's our 100 year anniversary celebration, that libraries are more relevant than ever before. Can you address that? Tell us why that is. I certainly can, and thank you, Mayor, for that. And thank you for all that you do for the libraries and from reading time to the others. Mm -hmm. There was a little news story this morning with a study, I believe it was a Pew Research study that was just recently done that demonstrates that there are people visit their library more than they do professional sports games. And there's probably a couple other things in there too. It was powerful. Um, is it true? It is, well, it's a study. So sometimes so you have to do true. a study to, to resignate <laughs> the, the obvious, but uh, the digital versus, you know, access to information is one thing but the library provides something very, very special. Um, it doesn't take but one visit to your library, meet somebody that's been there for a while. I met Kathy today who has been coming to our library since she was 14. She's probably uh, north of 50 wow. or more, uh, but she really was demonstrating how the library made a difference in her life. She continues to make a difference. She plays in the Monday Night Melodies. Her team or her family played in the very first Monday Night Melodies. She plays guitar and reads to children and that connection, the way she described how children come to her when she plays guitar, yeah. that is why we have libraries. The connection to community, the connection to each other, it is the same as the rec center and some of the others. It is not irrelevant just because we have the internet and all the information we ever need in our pocket. Uh, that is not going to replace the connection to the place or the connection to the program, and more importantly, the connection to other people. Mm -hmm. And so we have, we, have, we have gained more and more programming as time has gone on. Can you tell me about some of the programming? So over 40,000 have participated in the past, so registrations and, and participants, and that's everything from story time uh, to our the, uh, this coming up this weekend, we've got a book sale uh, that the friends are putting on. There's so many different ways that people engage. When the wild, uh, wildlife teams bring their boa constrictors, uh, yes. <laughs> um, the singing cowboy, uh, is, it, I, don't, I think he may have retired, but the, 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 the opportunities are so wide mm -hmm. and it's all literacy based, yeah. all learning based, and it's about inspiring, ins or inspiring the imagination. So the, the, the team does wonderful work. Our documentary, I mean, we could put a plug for the uh, Channel 11 uh, Emmy Award or the, the, the grand video Nodded. award that they got on the Knitted Knockers. Knitted Knockers. Uh, the Knitted <laughs> Knockers. And you think, again, a connection. People come together, do a craft to meet mm -hmm. women in need, to mm -hmm. help. And that's the, just a, a small 
uh, sample of the types of programs that go yeah, on. Absolutely, and age appropriate all the way from little tiny kids to well, people my age. I heard wheels on the bus <laughs> this morning. Did you hear wheels on the bus? <laughs> <laughs> Echoing from the children's area. Yeah. So it's absolutely, that's the type Both of, of, type of experiences that we're able to create by supporting a great public library. Incredible. And you did say 95,000 annual registrations. That was for our recreation our department. And our whole yeah. recreation. So just uh, 40,000 that participated in the programs, library specific, uh, 1.8 million in the circulation. So when we talk about digital, that may, that may include, I'll look uh, for, that does include the digital, uh, but the, the tactical still outweighs. In fact, I think that's one of our uh, key points as we look about uh, the challenges moving forward. Getting our librarians out and beyond just the mm -hmm. library. The libraries are hubs. We want to be able to bring uh, the core of information and the excitement of program out to communities, perhaps out oh. to some of our retirement communities, perhaps out to our more distant uh, facility or, or communities that have their own rec amenities. Rec amenities. There's a lot of opportunity, and mm -hmm. as, as soon as we have the right amount of staffing, then we can make those things happen. Well, and the, anybody who thinks that librarians are what you might remember from um, from your childhood when they just sat there and said, shh, not. yeah, that is not who librarians are anymore. They are involved and outgoing and exuberant and um, willing to create new programs for whoever walks in. They're amazing. Absolutely. Thank you. Mm -hmm. You're a great spokesperson. <laughs> um, so again, some of our challenges and just picking a few of these. We do, um, one of the things that may have been in the news, the uh, late fee and fine policies. Uh, that is something that some, some systems are considering waiving fees and fines, mm -hmm. or I should say they should be waiving fines. Fees would be about replacing stuff that you may have damaged or lost. A fine would be you just haven't turned it in on time. Uh, so there's, there's this uh, a bit of a debate. Some of the systems are considering it. We are analyzing it as far as the financial impact uh, and we'll take the, obviously take that up to you ahead of time. Part of this outreach and, and something that we hope to get a little bit of uh, reaction on from you is the concept of uh, changing our facility hours. We are currently well beyond any of our sister cities in this area, a uh, good number. Uh, staff, Nathaniel and his team are looking at where these opportunities, but if we were to start to shift, create two sets of times that we are open and um, still be a seven day a week operation, but shorten those days where we can create a single shift as opposed to trying to do two shifts, that's gonna free up some staff time for us to do that out and about programming. And if there's, before we go out to the public or get some feedback from, from the community, I wanted to toss this out to you to see what your, uh, how that resonates with you right off the bat. We have Nathaniel here if, if we wanna dive a little bit deeper, but if you're comfortable with us working with the community and then implementing some a bit of change in the hours of operation, again, we feel very comfortable that we're offering substantial amount of time, not talking about closing specific days, just shortening some of the lesser used, the lesser uh, frequented times, and, and then deploying that human resource uh, out into the community with some of the extra programs and activities. Council, do you have any comments, questions? Yes. Can you give me an example of what they would be doing out in the community, what one of those programs would be? Sure. So just as we we're kind of talking about doing the story times or leading some of the education classes or uh, technical programming the, or coordinating some of those. So in, in some of that, it does take time to coordinate the, um, the program offering, whether that's a weekly type of a program or a workshop. Those are just connecting with, and you know how we've worked to just make connections with the facility owners uh, in your district. And that's, it takes time and it takes relationship building. And that's what we would look to our librarians to be able to do. Not just the, and they certainly aren't, the, the shush librarians, but give them the, the, the time uh, or f allow at least a person to be able to shift and be dedicated to reaching and making, you have to connect place, you have to connect the talent, and then you have to connect to the, to the patron or the customer uh, to make it a true successful program. And w when we look about the spectrum of our programming, the free access, the free uh, access to information like the library offers, all the way to our cost recovery model that we have for our uh, special interest classes, that blend all blended together into uh, the library team, we believe is gonna be a step in the right direction. And that little shifts like this uh, help to align those resources. 
So, Mayor and, school and districts. Yeah, yeah. Mayor and Council Member Rubensbacher, one of the um, activities we're working on, and we will be in front of you to present this hopefully later in March, is a storefront pop up Peoria concept. Oh. And we very much um, are looking towards the library to do story times there. We would hope to replicate that elsewhere in the community, and by looking at the operating hours, that's the general concept. Certainly, we won't make any adjustments until we touch base and, and get back to you and, and share with you what we've learned from the community, but that's generally kind of the uh, thought process that we're having at our end. Okay. Councilmember Hunt? John, have you guys talked to the librarians about this yet? Absolutely. And I bet yeah. they're excited. They, they definitely want to make the connections with the community. They, they see the value, the, the challenge, the staffing challenges associated with the extended day, if that mm -hmm. makes any sense, um, is, is something that is a, a hurdle first, and then it's mm -hmm. the customer service. So yes, I, it, it wouldn't come forward to this point um, if the staff were not supportive. So uh, there's, um, we are well resourced. Uh, we are a leader in the availability of our two facilities. And we want to be to that next level of library and leisure experience when we talk about including the lifelong learning and other outside mm -hmm. types of programs and facilities. Oh, I, I think it's a great idea. I really do. Thank you. It's literally outside the box. Good. Literally. <laughs> literally outside <laughs> yes. the box. Literally. Um, and so, yeah, Councilmember Patena. Oh, oh, yes. So I've actually volunteered at the um, Sunrise Mountain Library for the past four summers. So I've put in about more than 150 hours. So I thought I could give some um, input on at least the kids section. Um, so I worked in the kids section mainly um, for, so I've worked almost all the time. So I've seen like how busy it is. Basically, there's a lot of kids during the summer because they don't have school. And after about 6.30, it kind of like draws out and it's not that too many people. But during like the days in the morning there's so many kids the kids section is completely filled and um, I've seen a few teens too but I can't say anything about the adults but for the kids there's a lot so that's all okay thank you thanks for that thanks so so it sounds to me like maybe if you know like everybody's supportive of it if we could have a little bit more information I'm interested to know what you can do outside of the community and how you might um, re reconfigure those hours I'd love to talk about it a little bit more. And, and we've got a white paper pulled together for that, oh, and, and we'll, we'll assimilate that in a, in a way that's digestible and uh, not too much data, uh, but just enough to be reasonable and um, get that to you for further, and you know, we'll look to probably implement soon. So okay. to that point of you know, the busy times as well, if we have the flexibility in creating other locations, maybe that uh, can, can help to disperse and not make one facility so busy. So uh, a lot of, right. a lot of, the team has done a lot of good thought in, into the concepting, so. Oh, good, one just to see it. Yes, Council Member Hunt. John, I don't know what you have coming up here, but uh, were you going to mention free little libraries because they certainly are, are you, is it they coming are. up? It is not. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's certainly outside the box. It is definitely outside the box. So uh, uh, what Council Member Hunt, thank you very much. The uh, Free Little Libraries, uh, a special project in partnership with the Friends of the Library. They've sponsored 10 and we've located those at City Parks. Uh, very, very great in concept, mm -hmm. not without its challenges. Um, some people don't respect the, the, the little box itself, uh, but the teams that are the volunteers that are there are taking care of them and uh, on more than one occasion. And I, I actually was able to install a number of them personally and met people who thought what a great idea this is, bringing literacy right to your neighborhood park. And uh, they're, they're just a cute little asset and, uh, and more importantly, engaging the friends and, and groups that are helping to supply the books and to provide that imagination right at a park. Yeah. Thank you. And the idea, of course, this was a trial. The idea is to go a step further and through planning, engage the public in having free little libraries in their own yards so that in a neighborhood there might be one or two and people dog walking or whatever would have access. So it really is taking the library out into the neighborhoods and I know that's something you're gonna be working on. Um, this takes community involvement and a lot of press and all that, <laughs> but it, it, it's a great idea. It's done around the world. It's a huge, huge movement. Correct. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So we already did that part. 
So we'll move right on to recreation and community facilities. Obviously the city of Peoria uh, and its uh, wonderful couple of amenities. The, uh, trying to stay at the 30,000 foot level, Peoria has some award winning and regionally recognized community facilities, the Rio Vista Recreation Center. Full service facility focusing on fitness, gymnasium, racquetball, multi-purpose rooms, leisure classes, and uh, special spaces for rentals. A number of people have given their vows, actually, at both of the locations now. We've had weddings at the sports complex as well. And of course, the crown jewel of, the Peor of Peoria, the, the sports complex. Uh, Peoria's access to the Unified School District has been a key determinant in leveraging and offering our recreation program. So a lot of our sports programs, obviously our AMPM program through Neighborhood and Human Services, uh, utilize the school facilities, and that is a, a project that was going to continue, uh, open communication and working on an IGA here in the next 2021. 20, we'll be working on that uh, to, to finalize that agreement. From a recreation standpoint, some quick stats here for you on the recreation programs. Uh, obviously very impressive to have over 6,000 in any, any given sports league right now. You can have 2,000 kids playing across Peoria in our uh, leagues. And uh, you can see them all wearing their fancy little Peoria outfits and uh, uniforms. Aquatics, we are knocking on the door at 10,000 participants in swim lessons. And something that, that many of you have supported uh, in, in ways uh, that are so, so important in removing the barrier. We talk about barriers to pools to keep them out if they can't swim, but barriers to participation, the financial barrier. Uh, we work uh, wholeheartedly with our firefighting, firefighters, uh, charities who contribute funds, we get grants. Uh, we do not want the swim lessons at only $25 for two weeks uh, to be a barrier to, the, to participation. Teaching kids to swim is an important and imperative uh, life skill. And uh, Rio Vista, uh, one of the things we're recognizing is that uh, we are seeing an uptick in the rental uh, amenities. So we want to be really good hosts and uh, want to focus on making sure that we keep the facility looking great. So again, uh, thinking about our objectives and some of our challenges, uh, this, the fee model, as we presented last year, we, we do have some opportunity. We do expect to get with you in the next couple of months on, on what might be a restructure of our fee, fee model um, with good clarity and good, good information. So that I look forward to spending time with you on that. Uh, the activation of our neighborhood parks uh, to encourage use and connection. Uh, one of the things that uh, we, we have done in programming, things like our uh, cleanups, the tri tri river and trail cleanup, we're now doing monthly, uh, Della with our park ranger group is out there monthly cleaning up uh, the New River Trail and some of the other areas. As she studies the environment in that area, she's finding more and more friends. Uh, I've been out twice now, and it is very rewarding to get that thank you from the person riding by on their bike. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is, uh, astonishing at how much trash there is in a city that you don't necessarily see it. Uh, some of the other programs uh, we're focusing on uh, this past weekend, there was uh, Billy's Place had a uh, great hike up at uh, Sunrise Mountain. So we can partner with other groups that are engaging the neighborhoods and making them active and healthy. Uh, we also have within the CIP program upcoming uh, reinvestment in our uh, the aquatic sites. Um, we're trying to build into an annual program, uh, but we've got a number of projects underway at the pools, uh, keeping those facilities, again, uh, supporting those nearly 10,000 swim lessons and the open swim, swim teams. Our challenges, uh, there's only so much space when it comes to our field allocation. This has not been, uh, this has been going on for a long time. Kids are active, the organized sports, uh, and that's part of why we are now doing Paloma Community Park, correct? Uh, the same with uh, the park that's on, next on our uh, agenda tonight, naming of uh, the park near the Meadows development. That's additional uh, amenities where sports fields, sports allocation can take place. The marketing, the Rio Vista has definitely seen more competition from the community, uh, if you or more competition within the community, from the EOS to the Purple, uh, what's our Planet Fitness, to now Lifetime Fitness. There's others that are focusing very similarly on, on fitness and recreation. We will have to be responsive to that. Above all, we focus on our customer service and our family connectivity at the, at the, community, or at the recreation center, and uh, we believe that that's an opportunity for success. 
And then uh, also we'll continue to assess our future recreation amenities and our high growth areas. Uh, adding Paloma is one step. We have, certainly have a larger vision. We wanna keep in connection with the community and the growing areas. What is additive, not duplicative, when we think about the types of facilities that we are going to add as the city grows. With that, we'll jump right into the sports complex overview. Uh, certainly the crown jewel of Peoria. Uh, while we do have uh, 29 games, la or had 29 uh, games last year, still had over 180,000 fans. Um, certainly a big economic impact. Uh, the ASU Seidman Institute uh, provided some really good information and I think it's been used over and over again um, to recognize the importance of these facilities. I think that something that sets us apart as Peoria is the fact that we have a 12 month operation, not a 30 day operation. We utilize that facility. We had another 180,000 plus uh, patrons with 178 events in 2019 alone. Peoria uses the Peoria Sports Complex for Peoria. Uh, we recognize the value of spring training. We benefit our uh, citizens uh, with the uh, robust discount uh, for the spring training. And uh, you know, really, really good work uh, from Blake and the team at the sports complex. So some of our <laughs> objectives this year to align our maintenance disciplines, uh, to focus on uh, event development, uh, anything from food stock uh, to concerts, car shows, uh, you know, Blake and team are definitely gonna evaluate all of those. It's a destination event venue. Uh, and obviously we're gonna, again, complete in our 27th year of successful spring training, thanks to the team. Challenges, uh, obviously we were focusing on the potential for redevelopment of the parking lot area. Chris Calcaterra has been knee deep, eye deep, head deep, deep. Uh, very focused on being a, a partner of, of information uh, and uh, to do the right thing for Peoria. Uh, we are going to maintain uh, the, the facility as the premier facility. And we want to make sure that we're making the right investments in those special areas. I always hearken back to the, the ship. That playground ship is unlike anything else. And that's, that's one of those investments that you as council have really put forward and uh, made, made the sports complex so unique. Uh, the earlier season, we do want to art articulate this, that the earlier season has an impact on uh, the overall attendance and the overall financial picture. Uh, it is what it is. Our team is really focusing on how can we attract those that are already here, not worrying about uh, the, the folks coming from elsewhere, or, and getting out to uh, our, our host cities, San Diego and Seattle, to make sure that they're well aware that the season starts so much earlier. So mm -hmm. lots of work going on in that area. Upcoming also, World Baseball Classic, that's another opportunity for us to do uh, great things and to expect attendance and use to, to rise. Chris, anything else on training in that area? Awesome. Go because I think this is where we have the red line. Any council questions or comments? Council, any comments? So, so the earlier season opening is gonna happen from now on, is that correct? Correct. Um, and so maybe after this season, you know, everyone will get used to it in the future. Are we thinking that? That would be our hope. And uh, I think the travel, folks will get, get accustomed to traveling. I think the teams are gonna start to continue to make adjustments. Uh, we're going to stay, you know, boots on the ground, understanding the dynamics, uh, the uh, way uh, Blake and the team, our connection with the Office of Tourism uh, is really focusing on the data and, and everything that we measure and how can we be better at knowing and then better at reacting to and be better at attracting. Uh, just to add to Major League Baseball is working with us. They're releasing the schedule earlier so we can actually go into the regional markets <gasps> sooner. So people are making decisions, you know, two months ahead of travel. So they, they are working with us. In the past, Good. it wasn't as open. Yeah. So they recognize the problem as well. To your point, though, the CBA, the, gov uh, the baseball agreement, is a five-year agreement, so we have three years left on that. Uh, so right now, it's a, it's a union contract with Major League Baseball players and the ownership of Major League Baseball. So we know for three years, for the next three years, it's going to be like this. Correct, yeah. After that, we don't know. Right. Okay, thanks. All right, so neighborhood and community parks. Uh, obviously very, very proud of our system, as uh, we all should be. 34 parks in our inventory, and we've got a new one to name tonight. Two community parks, Rio Pioneer and our new Paloma Park under construction. Our uh, landscape maintenance of all of our city right-of-ways, retention basins, facilities and special districts, Iola Town, 
Uh, we've got a lot of things going on. Our park rangers uh, with, with the department reorgs a couple years ago uh, have really made a difference in our connecting with the community. Uh, and we have also made some staffing shifts to put a focus on our city trails and our open spaces. Does the shade master plan come under this umbrella or is that a different group? Different department? The engineering department is focusing on that, but I can assure you uh, that our team uh, are, what do we call those? SMEs? <laughs> Subject matter experts. We are reviewing the document and inputs are definitely made based on landscape, uh, hardscapes, and, and structure. Okay. So a lot of that integration. I'm going to throw it out there. I've, I've professed to that team that we should really focus on trying to be the shadiest city in America. But for some reason, it, doesn't re it, it just doesn't resonate with some, you know. <laughs> I think so we should just keep saying it more. If we say it more often, we're the shadiest city in America. <laughs> that works. The, um, yeah, our, our team has been very involved. And, and again, I think this is uh, indicative of our, of our entire uh, operations team, uh, that, that we recognize the intersections and how our talents and our passions uh, from our, our guys that are the arborists and, uh, and then the, the streets folks, uh, the transit teams, the, the way that people walk about our community, uh, we're a difficult layout. Our map is odd. So to, to really uh, make our, the locality of our walkability and, and focus on that shade falls to all of our responsibilities. So thank you for bringing that up. I think that's um, something that is actually sitting on our desks right now, getting close. So a lot of work going in there. That's Mayor, right. Um, Mayor, we'll make sure that uh, we do provide you an update here shortly and in advance of the budget sessions as well, so you have a good sense of uh, what type of further investments we might be able to take in that area. So good, thank you. Other than that, that's horrible branding, I have to say. It's horrible branding. <laughs> you don't buy slogans, no. Okay, okay understood, it. Jeff. I won't say it any longer. All right. <laughs> so uh, wait, let me, let me just hit back on that one, if it will, let me. So uh, a key point for us in, in throughout the, the entirety of our system in parks, neighborhood parks, and the community parks is that balance of the reinvestment. So taking care of the parks within the inventory and thinking about those next new ones has been a mantra of ours, certainly has been supported with a lot of the programs that you as council have funded, and uh, certainly vi very viable in, in how we manage the entirety of our system. Councilmember Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, John, can you, or, or Chris maybe, um, can you talk a little bit, um, how are we doing on our bids? It's coming up. Sure, we've got, actually that's a good section coming up. We, we've okay. dedicated a special section okay. for, for maintenance, or for the mids and the basins and okay. the other areas. So we've got some good photos on that too. But yeah, we'll, we'll dive into that. Thank you. Uh, but to start that, when I talk about the reinvestment, uh, the refurbishment, uh, Councilmember Finn, or Vice Mayor Finn, uh, we were out here just a couple weeks ago on a Saturday, hundreds of people out for a park fest, and uh, it is, this is probably one of the, this is an example of how we had a program for playground replacement, and then coupled with the uh, landscape refurbish and some of the other park amenities, uh, playgrounds have become not what we are used to. They're really getting dynamic with their build, uh, the colors, uh, and the interactivity. Uh, this project afforded us an opportunity to paint the restrooms and provide new site amenities with the benches and, uh, and, and tables and trash cans and everything else. Really good work there. A couple others that we have on the project, that's not somebody's lost lap, uh, tablet. Uh, that is actually a demonstration of our CalSense technology all about water um, and utilizing technology to manage our water resource throughout the entire system. You funded that this year. All the equipment's been ordered. We are going to, over the next several months, be installing that at the different locations. This gives us a centralized computer system that helps us respond to evapotranspiration details throughout the city. It may be raining in South Peoria, but not in North Peoria. Uh, so uh, the, the details will be provided through technology and the, the team will be able to make those adjustments. The, um, that is something that we see we'll be leveraging into the future. We'll always be spending on technology, uh, so we do see that as, as an important and vital investment. Uh, Alta Vista Park, we've got money teed up for some landscape enhancements there and then Deer Village is on, on slate for uh, a playground replacement and some landscaping as well. Uh, we've got a number of examples uh, for our turf reduction program of uh, Fletcher Heights, and then teed up is uh, Park Ridge Park. Uh, we have our 
uh, two uh, pretty major projects with both um, Sonora Mountain Ranch and uh, Country Meadows. Uh, we've updated on those. Uh, both of those projects are underway, nearing completion in the design and permitting. And uh, both had very extensive uh, community outreach uh, efforts. And then the new park that we'll talk about tonight is teed up for uh, development this year. A great example of the shade initiative is in the Country Meadows renovation project, we added a, uh, an arenasium, which is a shade structure, if you will, over the uh, basketball multipurpose court. So oh. it's first in our system. We are, we are looking at that as an opportunity for the shade initiative um, to, to acknowledge. It's right across from the school, obviously, so it's a great opportunity for kids. And you called it an airnasium? Airnasium. A new word, huh? Airnasium. <laughs> I like it. They are, uh, they're actually, thank you for bringing that up, Chris. They are very much appreciated throughout the Southwest. And we talk about, I'll, I'll talk about some trends nationally, um, but the airnasium, we're very, very proud of uh, where we've uh, been. This project is going to be the demonstration project was one of the very top citizen requested uh, elements from uh, the community outreach was shade. Uh, mm -hmm. The shade, uh, security, some of the other elements, but uh, the shade was, was way up there. I personally, out putting in a little library, was there on a hot 120 degree day and kids were still playing basketball. So <laughs> they love their basketball. Yeah. So uh, jumping up to the community parks, obviously this is uh, an overview of Paloma. Construction is underway. It's absolutely fabulous from uh, backstops to ball field lighting to buildings and in the back there, that's pickleball. And uh, so we heard a lot from the pickleball folks. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of great work going on out there. Kudos to the team. This was a project that we brought to you, uh, Rio Vista, playground replacement. A project we, we talked about last year, uh, it encountered some delay challenges uh, with our design architect. So we are still in process uh, working forward. These concepts are uh, pretty fabulous coming out of the, the design. That structure in the middle uh, beyond the shade is about 36 feet tall, 32 to 36 feet tall, uh, netting inside. Uh, like I said, the, the playgrounds have really come a long way. A little green swoopy thing you see in the front there, uh, fully accessible and uh, adaptive type of uh, amenity for the merry-go-round. Uh, the swing that you see, the arching swing there, is uh, really um, designed for uh, community play as well as for those with special needs. And a big plug to Peoria Unified School District, uh, we actually have focus groups with their occupational therapists. So we had three participate with Paloma Parks Playground and then this a renovation for Rio Vista. That is and so great. And they were super excited to be part of it. They actually came in with our design team, engineering team, and really we learned, all learned a lot from each other. So great exercise. And so is everything that I'm looking at on this picture um, available? I mean, is it fully inclusive for all kids? This is as inclusive as occupational therapists can make it. There are some mm -hmm. areas, and actually they had some really neat ideas, sandboxes, um, mm -hmm. going old school, if you will, in, yeah. in a you know, newer uh, age facility. So uh, yes, I think the answer is yes. Um, the reality is there are some sections that you know we're, we're making areas to reach out to those uh, you know, uh, apparatuses and amenities mm -hmm. that everybody can play together. The key is having them play together. So. And, and have we retrofitted some of our um, older parks with more accessible play areas? When we do our current renovation for playgrounds at our, our neighborhood parks, we do mm -hmm. go in and now that we have some standardized uh, amenities that yeah. the occupational therapists help us, we now put those in our program as we replace. Good, that's great. So, so that playground replacement program, we're now on our eighth. So Sweetwater was our eighth playground done under this. And you'll recall Jake Eason was very intent on mm -hmm. including the community um, getting feedback and having inclusive elements of all of those playgrounds. So fully accessible from an ADA standpoint, mm -hmm. inclusivity is a different uh, piece of the, the equation, a much higher caliber, if you will. And uh, both our, uh, this playground replacement as well as the Paloma uh, New Park is, are very much focused and we've got those experts that are chiming in on all the elements of the playground design and construct. And I couldn't be more proud of an industry. The playground industry has been really a leader in understanding play and accessibility mm -hmm. and inclusivity. So it's not just having the ability to get to one and it's not just the kid playing, it could be the parent. So there's a lot of details mm -hmm. that go into and they're thinking through everything. Yeah, it's, it's powerful. Mm -hmm. uh, it'd be easy to just dismiss it as a, just a playground, 
but it's so, so much more yeah. and, and makes a difference. And to be able to, to look at the capacity uh, financially, uh, the capacity from a spatial standpoint to be able to do all of these projects, that's a very, very much a pride point for Peoria. And as well it should be. I really appreciate that you've done eight of them so far and that our new ones will be built that way. So thank you. Thank you. Mm. So another pride point of Peoria, uh, we've got a before and an after here. Uh, the before, while not bad, uh, was not substantial. And uh, the McCain Plaza is, uh, was also completed last year, uh, just uh, in time for Veterans Day. And uh, there we have additional seating and good shade. <laughs> So with that, uh, a lot of our objectives this year have been to you know, complete projects in a timely manner. Uh, obviously, that too is one of the challenges, com completing, completing in a timely manner by nature of the industry today. Uh, the com competition for resources is tight. Uh, maintaining our level of service, being very responsive, continuing with our sustainability practices, water conservation. I think we are the largest customer for Peoria Water. Uh, so if I can put them out of business, wait, that won't add up, right? No. Um, but no, we work very closely with, uh, with them and uh, they with us. So uh, the investment in the shade and the tree replacement, our focus is definitely in those areas. Uh, from our, some of our challenges, getting, uh, getting these next projects underway. Construction is always a, a, a difficult part of the process. You don't know what you're going to get until you get into it. Uh, and it definitely takes time and resource. Uh, oversight of our contractors and our vendors. Uh, there's, they're having the same uh, filling positions as we are. So our supervision of the contracts uh, is part of our challenge moving forward. We're also working with facilities. Each of our parks have electrical and plumbing, those trades, those technical trades, uh, that type of a work. Well, there's a lot uh, of growth that's going on throughout the city that may, may not keep our issues as a priority. But we're working with Public Works to identify some creative ways within the budget process to uh, to put our priority on top and to make sure that our parks remain uh, in good repair. And then of course, uh, as I said earlier, staffing recruitment and retention. With that, any thoughts, questions? Council, comments? No, you've covered it all. Great. And here we are, just for Council Member Edwards, our <laughs> basin refresh and rights of way. Uh, through your program, we're now in our third, or going into our fourth year of retention basin focus, uh, the rights of way focus. Uh, this is a, an inventory of four recent uh, completions. Uh, I think over the past year, we created, we demonstrated uh, three different versions of some of how we would approach uh, the, these redo projects an A, B, and a C uh, off, uh, offering. The C being maybe a little bit more of an amenity. Uh, passive recreation or even active recreation. The 109th and Adam uh, actually has a, a short loop walk and uh, it looks like kids are riding bikes on it now and doing their tire skids on it. But uh, yeah, there's, uh, there's always uh, you know, a way for us to include and engage the neighborhood through these, uh, utilizing these spaces. So let's go back to that. I don't wanna show you ugly weeds yet. Councilmember Edwards, were there specifics that you wanted to talk about with? No, I just wanted to get an update on, on main specifics. So, so uh, similarly, we've gone through prioritized based on the conditional assessment and have those teed up uh, within the current budget as well as next year's budget. So if there's any specific, I think the real message is that we're responsive when you see things, uh, regardless of whether we're on council, on staff, or in the public, uh, uh, us knowing about it, our, our coordinating with our contractors on staff and our staff, uh, to, uh, to ensure that we're getting quick response and then they're prioritized. So it might not be, weeds may be there, speaking of weeds, um, weeds may be there, but our current level of service for our rights of way uh, and our basins is that one month landscape and attention and weekly trash. And we actually have bifurcated that with uh, some of our key areas like the uh, P83 area, Auto Mall, are, are gonna have a higher level of standard uh, but this is an example of the weed bloom, uh, which everybody is currently a victim of. And uh, that's a treatment area in the middle, same area right after treatment and uh, dusting of uh, herbicide. And then on the right, when you see the green out there, uh, that's not somebody uh, doing graffiti or anything. They're actually uh, taking care of and treating the weeds to uh, prevent them from growing. This, these are a couple of ideal pictures. These were taken from today, right? Uh, 
here at uh, 75th and Crocus. And, uh, and then uh, the right hand picture demonstrates some of the technologies. And we talk about the CalSense and uh, the receiver and how that uh, all works. Um, I do just want to to address our right of ways, and you know, I mean, it's it's important for us to to worry about cost containment. There's so many of them, and then we've got such a, a large land mass in our city. But we have to remember that the way we take care of our yards um, gives the pride of our city, and it helps other people's property values to remain high, and it helps other people to to move here, and it really is the brand of the city of Peoria, how well we take care of our city. So what you're doing here matters. It, it reverberates in so many different ways. So um, I appreciate all that you're doing. I just want you to remember how far-reaching it is. Very well said. Thank you. So one of the major objectives this past year, uh, we actually have a single contractor for the majority of our right-of-way inventory, uh, which is good. Uh, it's just a different way of approach. We, we broke it up in previous sessions. This time they bid and uh, effectively bid. Uh, we're working with them on a daily basis through our staff. Uh, again, uh, we created the design standard options for the retention area refreshes, and we work in the different areas as we move those forward based on the priority measuring. Uh, we'll, we'll continue to tackle those projects. And then uh, actively monitoring the costs, so the cost containment, uh, the maintenance improvement district, or the working with maintenance improvement districts, as well as the city-owned retention basins uh, is, is really, it's, it's key, it takes a lot of time. We rely on the entire, the entire team, business services, as well as the finance team to uh, ensure that our costs are identified and that we're charging the maintenance improvement districts the right way and that we've got the resource allocation. Challenges, mother nature. Mother nature, she can be a, a hoot. And uh, <laughs> the art and the science of promoting and mitigating uh, the vegetation growth, it's a daily challenge and it's seasonal, um, it happens. Again, we're, we've got a good system in place. Uh, we're holding, uh, holding them accountable, but Mother Nature still grows good weeds. So the oversight, uh, again, I, I've had this listed before, working with those contractors. We're leveraging our, our resources and using contractors. We still believe in the, the approach and, uh, and it's a good balance. With that, any questions, concerns, additional? I see none. So the park rangers, as I mentioned, they came to our, uh, our department a couple years ago with the reorg, and uh, really, um, I could not be more proud uh, of a group of professionals, uh, you know, whether they're focused on their projects and initiatives within, uh, either they engage the, the community, they uh, work with their own hands, they, they work on sustainable education, uh, really results in the promotion and the conservation of our natural resources. Uh, these are these guys are really um, and gal are, are very uh, faux programming frontline customer service education of our uh, parks rules uh, not everybody realizes that it's not legal to ride your motorcycle in a park or down the trail um, and so they work to help educate uh, the uh, citizen assistants they're, they're out there often uh, working in the, the community parks where we have the density of our programs and the density of our uh, people uh, primarily, but they work to educate. Um, and then preservation and protection of our natural habitat. Uh, really great knowledge, great resource, everything from our environment. Got a really good picture here. There's Dan saving a duck. Uh, <laughs> they're out, you know, while they're out on the trail, we're, we're providing a good, uh, good information on uh, the, the issues that are out there, having folks slow down because we're out cleaning things up. Uh, we talk about the eyes of Peoria, utilizing the a Peoria Reporter app, and we last year implemented the Ranger Hotline. It has become very effective. So that hotline, you can leave a voice message, and it gets it gets sent via email to the Ranger on duty. They can respond, uh, but they're not necessarily uh, as fast as uh, non-emergency police line. Which, in the event of a crime, we want people to to continue to call there. So our objectives have been to increase the educational interactions, uh, volunteer engagement. I talked about Della leading a monthly volunteer engagement. Last time, I think we had 36 people out picking up trash out of the New River area right by uh, Rio Vista. 
and spending time out on the trails. It is, again, one of those great reports when you get the feedback from the hikers. Uh, today we got an email about asking about conflicts between bike uh, mountain bikers and hikers, and that, that happens. Um, so we wanna, wanna be able to respond to those uh, concerns and have our rangers be intimately involved in educating the community. Our challenges, always, uh, partnering with citizens. Um, there are a lot of different groups and that is having enough time and attention and to organize them, it's certainly one of those challenges. Uh, inspections, uh, both from a playground standpoint as well as some of the other areas when our neighborhood and community parks, uh, we inspect everything from lighting controls to landscape controls, the, the conditions, the conditional assessment of what's going on, all of that leads to our park safety. So with that, any questions or comments? Nope. So we are, uh, speaking of the park safety aspect, we do have a pilot program uh, underway uh, locking some of the different uh, bathrooms uh, throughout the city as well. Typically we respond if there's issues within some of the neighborhood parks, we will lock them for a couple of days or a couple of weeks and see if that doesn't change the human behavior of inappropriate actions. Uh, but we are working through that, documenting and working with, uh, with police uh, very frequently on the different issues. Good. Great. Thank you. So moving on to the open space and the trails. Uh, obviously, uh, from an overview standpoint, we focus on the, uh, the shared uh, use pathways, uh, our mountain trails. We have such a great resource. Uh, the tree inventory, being shady again, uh, 13,871 trees that have, uh, Brandon has been able to inventory. And I know that's not all of them. I just have a feeling <laughs> that there's more. Um, but that's just in, in some of the landscape areas. I want to give a real highlight and credence to the work that this council and previous and uh, the planning department on the uh, Sonoran Preservation Program and the DLCO, the, the ordinance associated with desert lands conservation. Key and instrumental, very effective, utilized all the time in working with development today, mm -hmm. really coming to a crossroad as we grow as a community. Those tools and the foresight that went into that planning and timing and adoption uh, were absolutely important. And then last year we talked about the implementation of our wayfinding. So we did the wayfinding signage and study program and uh, that we get, showed you some descriptions uh, last year uh, on the right hand side. This map gives a quick overlook of our current preserve areas and this is actually just a sort of a drop in the bucket with what we have coming on the, the very near future with Paloma Park which is just to the north of West Wing Mountain. Uh, that north of West Wing in connection with East Wing represent over 3,000 square acres of, of open space. Uh, when you talk about the impoundment area and our east wing, west wing, all contiguous. So very, very much uh, a future recreational asset for us. So uh, east wing and west wing will be connected? They, they will be connected through the uh, impoundment area of the Paloma Park. Oh, okay, yeah. go down and they go back up. Touch. Yes, yes. Okay. We, from, the, from a trail connection standpoint, that is our intent. And that's, that's part of what our objectives are, is to work with the Flood Control District uh, to identify, manage uh, the trails assets out there and connecting to West Wing, connecting to East Wing, uh, really a, a great resource. And here's, uh, so we talked about it last year and we've implemented this year. So uh, some of the examples, the, the, the mileage uh, markers, the little round dot, I wish I had a better picture, but the little round dot actually has a mileage marker indicator that if you call 911 and you tell them I'm at uh, NR 71, they're gonna be able to look on their system and be able to dispatch aid to that location. So using a little bit of uh, GIS technology, a little bit of physical uh, information, uh, somebody calling 911 could helpful, helpfully uh, make that connection. The branding, uh, the Peoria with the swoop through there, uh, the, the existing, uh, the blue stands for our river trails, the green stands for our mountain trails. Uh, the signage has really become, uh, and I've gotten personal really uh, positive feedback from the community on this. Good information, good brand. Great. We've added some trail enhancements with some of the tools, uh, benches, uh, gate control areas, and uh, obviously trying to, first and foremost to keep people safe and enjoying our parks. Uh, this project is the 99th and Olive Trailhead that is currently under feasibility study. Uh, we, this is where we got the EPA grant 
and they are out studying the underground conditions. Uh, in, in fact, this month, so in the coming weeks, we should have a little more information about the viability of this becoming a recreational asset and a pretty major trailhead right there off of Olive. Mm -hmm. And we continue to focus on the New River Trail system moving north. And um, our next iteration is uh, up to uh, Happy Valley and then from Happy Valley up to Joe Max. And connecting to the regional system, the pink you, line you see cutting across, not the orange line, that is the 303. Pink line represents the CAP. So our objectives, obviously uh, continuing to utilize the programs, focusing on trail connections throughout the community, and partnering with those trails and open space groups. Mary, you've been a sponsor of CASCA, the Central Arizona Conservation Alliance. This Thursday, we have an, a group uh, the convening here at Rio Vista to talk about the next iteration of that plan uh, and uh, the White Tank Conservancy as well, great resources. And then uh, obviously some of the challenges working with developers, uh, funding and acquisition. We do not have the uh, luxury of utilizing impact fees any longer for open space and trails. So that's uh, gonna be a challenge. Our regional collaboration and connectivity, things that we're working on, and then finding that right balance between development and maintaining our natural environment. Any questions? No questions. Awesome. So getting ready to wrap all this up, I wanted to throw in a few things, some national trends. Uh, from a technology standpoint, we're seeing an increased use of uh, video cameras, obviously drones, not just for uh, using as tools throughout the community, but also for recreational use. Esports, they're getting big. Uh, AIA of it is uh, the Arizona Interscholastic Association evidently is going to use uh, esports as a as a high school sport. Uh, so we want to be on those trends and see what opportunities we have. Climate change, uh, the weather getting warmer. Uh, we talked about being a shade city, uh, planting more shade. Uh, its parks are an important combatant to the hotter weather. Places that we can go. Um, also, uh, lighting lighting of our sports fields. So playing a little bit later into the night. Uh, is one of those ways that, uh, that we're responding to the warmer weather. Recreation program, uh, we've seen things like adult recess, uh, getting back to Foursquare for adults and uh, tetherball, <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's fun. Um, the, uh, and then cause-related programs. I mentioned Billy's Place earlier uh, being out on Saturday. Uh, those causes, uh, whether they're running 5Ks or doing mountain climbs, coming together in community parks. So the cause-related programs are, are very much popular. And then micro mobility. A call, a shout out to Kevin and uh, the, the transit team, but uh, utilizing e-bikes and scooters. If you think about e-bikes, uh, more and more people are using them to be out on mountain trails, uh, where they might not have been able to do it physical limitations. Now they can because they have the assistive work of the e-bikes. So things we're keeping an eye on. And so with that, uh, we've got a handful of things that we want to summarize. But we'll be able to wrap this up if there's any questions, concerns, we look forward to hearing from you. Great, thank you. That was a, a fabulous presentation. We are doing so many things and all of it is citizen centric and, and aimed at not only being the best that we can be now, but the best that we can be in the future. So I just completely appreciate all of the work that you've done, all of you. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And I believe that is it. Right. Thank you. Uh, Mayor and Council, great conversations. Really appreciate all the work uh, that our, our mm -hmm. department's done. John, thank you for the, the great overview. A couple yeah. items that we will uh, be getting back to you on. So further explanation as we explore in the library area, the outreach and maybe the trade-off on our hours. So we will uh, make sure that you're well informed on that, as well as discuss different ways that we do an outreach to, uh, to our focus groups in that area. Uh, and also look, of course, um, continue our efforts in exploring the free little libraries and other cool programming concepts like that that really connect our neighborhoods as well. Uh, the Shade Master Plan update and um, some of the proposed investments that were coming in, you saw uh, some of that already coming. Uh, we'll make sure we have a more comprehensive assessment for you very shortly. And uh, as was mentioned, really making sure that we keep an eye on our own yards uh, because I think that's exactly right. As we recognize one of the things that makes us a distinctive community is the way that we take care of uh, all of our areas, including especially our right of way. So just a couple items that we'll be following up on. Thank Good. you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And with that, we are adjourned until our 7 p.m. meeting.
and practice equipment. We look forward to hearing from you soon. Do you know how to recycle in Peoria? Here are a few tips to make sure you do. All recycling needs to be empty and dry. Don't bag your recyclables, except for shredded paper. Shredded paper should be placed in a clear plastic bag. Make sure that newspapers, magazines, printing paper, paper sacks, junk mail, and envelopes make it into your dark brown recycle bin. Do not throw paper plates, paper cups, paper towels, napkins, or tissues into the dark brown recycle bin. Peoria definitely wants to see cardboard boxes in the recycling bin. This includes moving, shipping, and shoe boxes. Get creative and place cardboard egg cartons and tubes from gift wrap, paper towels, and toilet tissue into your dark brown recycle bin. Even pizza boxes can be thrown in the recycle bin as long as they don't have greasy cheese or other foods on them. Usually that means recycling just the top, but even that reduces what goes in the trash by 50%. Food and beverage bottles and jars are the only types of glass that can go into the dark brown bin. These bottles and jars should be rinsed out before throwing them into the dark brown recycle bin. Carefully bag and tie other types of glass like windows and drinking glasses. Those go into the tan trash bin. As a general rule, plastics from your refrigerator pantry, or bathroom can be recycled. Typically, this includes plastic bottles that hold milk, juice, soda, and laundry detergent. Even lids are okay, as long as they are secured to the bottle. The two big exceptions to recyclable plastics are plastic bags and styrofoam, even if they have the recycle symbol on them. Send plastic bags back to the grocery store. Styrofoam belongs in the tan trash bin. Metal cans from beverages and food like soup, vegetables, and tuna are great things to recycle. Please rinse out the food before placing these in the dark brown bin. Metal appliances, wire hangers, and other metal items should not be placed in the recycle bin. Call Peoria Solid Waste for info on how to recycle those items. Now you're all set. Want more information on how to recycle in Peoria? Visit www.peoriaaz.gov slash recycle or call 623-773-7160. Yeah, bro. You want to go to death, bro? Yeah, bro. Right on, bro. Hey, last one there pays. Sounds good, bro. Let's do it. Hey, you might want to check your after construction first. I know what I'm doing. I go this way every day. What? Hey, Siri, give me the quickest route to Dutch Bros. Oh, I knew there'd be construction. I'm totally going to be in there. Something by me, Dutch Bros. Dutch Bros. Construction! Every time, every time I leave the house, there's construction somewhere. I wish it was a place that, like, had construction so I could just know where it's at. I mean, how am I supposed to know there's construction? It's almost like there is no way for me to know there's construction. Come on, guys, go, go, go! Make sure next time you check your map app for road construction and road conditions so you can get here a little bit sooner. But by the way, you owe my 50 bucks. See you later. Welcome to historic Old Town Peoria. Thank you for joining us for the live grand opening of the Community Assistance Resource Center. 
Located in the Peoria Community Center at 8335 West Jefferson, this new facility is a partnership between the City of Peoria and at this time, 11 nonprofit groups that provide assistance, training, and opportunity to the citizens of Peoria. Services provided include financial, healthcare, child development, nutrition, adaptive programs, and more. Peoria residents can get information, attend workshops, sign up for assistance, or consult with experts for a variety of needs in this dynamic new facility. was that let's give him another round of applause great job great job I tell you I want to start every meeting that way that's a great way everybody's got a smile on their face it's a packed audience welcome everybody I'm Chris Hallett I'm uh, proud to be uh, the director of the new neighborhood and human services director uh, who oversees this fantastic building and, and, and in charge of what we're going to outline today uh, in a lot of glorious fashion as you saw with that kickoff here. So we couldn't have done it without a lot of help and support and many years of sweat and equity and we're going to be spending some time here this morning thanking a whole host of people, uh, none of which we couldn't thank anymore for the undying support as our mayor and council who helped provide us uh, the support and financing to get where we're here today to build out this wonderful building. We have 2,000 square feet of added addition to the building to add right now currently 11 nonprofits that are going to better serve our community here right here in the heart of the city of Peoria so up first again uh, fresh off her tour of the state of the city we have our mayor who <laughs> mayor I hope this help puts a notch in the complete city and most livable part of Peoria that we believe we already have here today so please help me welcome mayor Kathy Carlett Thank you, Chris. Yes, it certainly does put a notch in the, the belt that we need for the complete city. So good morning. Gosh, it's so great to see so many people here today. Uh, and it is an honor for me to be here as we celebrate the opening of our Com Community Assistance Resource Center. You know, the city of Peoria is really known for offering an exceptional quality of life for our residents. We have diverse housing options, top-rated schools, and some of the very best public services available. Our parks and recreation facilities are nationally ranked and serve hundreds of thousands of people every single day. Our streets and water systems are thoughtfully planned, safe, and reliable. And we rest easy every night knowing that our first responders are committed to serving and protecting our city all day, every day. But even with all that we have, a community is only as strong as its people. The well-being of every person and every family in our community strengthens our whole community. And beginning today, this center will provide the access that we need for the opportunities for health, stability, and self-sufficiency. None of this would have been possible, though, without a courageous leader with a big heart. Councilmember Patena, since you took office, you have been committed to expanding human services to enhance the well-being of our residents. You weren't afraid to dream big, and you weren't afraid to think of new ways to go above and beyond the status quo. You gave this project hope and confidence and now, because of your efforts, we have more than 11 organizations standing ready to serve and support Peoria residents. On behalf of the entire City Council and the entire City of Peoria, thank you for your compassion and thank you for your leadership. <laughs> there is an old saying that says, we rise by lifting others, and this center is here to lift. 
It's here to boost the very core of our community with the resources to assist our residents as they strive to live their very best lives. What an honor it is to be here today. Thank all of you for being here, and it's a great celebration. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Appreciate that. Um, you know, every great community service and program and facility like this has to belong and serves the citywide Peoria uh, has to be somewhere. And I know our next speaker is very proud that it's in her uh, dis uh, district. It's one of many gems here in the Acacia District. So please help me welcome Mayor Pro Tem, Vicki Hunt. Well, thank you for that warm welcome, and thank you, Chris, for saying those nice things. Wow, it is a big audience. Look at all of you. And I just like to think that you're here not to hear us, but really to celebrate this wonderful event and this wonderful resource center that we're opening today. And I think we have some leaders from other Valley cities. Could I see if we do have any of you here? Uh, I thought we were going to. Okay. Pardon? They're in the back. Are they shy? Um, well, I, I do want to point out, thank you very much to uh, those of you who came uh, to support us. But in the spirit of support to our neighboring cities, would like to point out that while we have the gym here, uh, there are so many resources throughout our valley. And thanks to Surprise, who helped pay for this booklet, they paid, from what I understand, for the Spanish version of this booklet. So this covers the entire West Valley, and, and we're so proud. Um, first, first opened in 1982, this community center has really long been the heartbeat of Peoria. Paula Considine, who is, you know I was going to say your name, didn't you? Uh, who, ha who, I'll just say, runs this, she really is the heartbeat of this particular facility, has been here for 30 years. Let's give her a... <laughs> and it doesn't matter what time, day or night, I think she has a bed in the back because <laughs> she is here. Uh, so thank you, Paula. I don't believe this would be what it is today without your vision, your leadership, your enthusiasm, your energy, and certainly your support. And I know you're very happy to have this relief coming, aren't you? <laughs> and then also by way of paying tribute to this particular facility that's already here, Josie Salas has been with our, you want to raise your hand? and. Josie has been here for 33 years. It's good to work in Peoria. It really is. Um, she's so special in her job. She's director of the CAP office. And I, what I think endears her to us and to the people she serves is that she has been here for so long. She knows the backstories. She knows the people who have lived in uh, not just Old Town, but other parts of Peoria. She's known them for, some of them, 33 years. She knows their needs before they ask. And sometimes they may be too frail to actually ask, but she knows their needs. Josie, you are just a jewel in our crown here, and we couldn't be what we are today without you. So thank you. And I know you're happy to see this come <laughs> give you some relief also. <laughs> So when we say community center, we really mean the center or the gathering place for people, all kinds of people in need and some not visible need. We have uh, classes to keep uh, older people in shape and so on. That's great. Um, this, this facility, and I'll probably leave out some of the things you do, but they serve teens, they serve special needs, they serve seniors physical fitness, they have a program with WHAM for Veterans Art for Healing, and if you had been here this morning, you would have been trampled 
by folks picking up food boxes, and this happens every Thursday morning. Um, okay, so we had this building here since 1982. It was getting old, and so our first renovation was in 2013. And I'm very blessed to have been on the council at that time, and I, I'm also very proud to say that the renovations that were done on this are LEED certified, and we have um, LEED, of course, means you know approved by the EPA standards, and it's one of the highest awards you can get or certifications. And we have not only our um, our higher level staff, Jeff Tyne, and and I believe it was Carl at the time, but uh, council, and then a, another very special person to us, Ed Striffler, who was in charge of our new program, but was also in charge of the renovation of this program. And he absolutely demands the highest quality in workmanship, and rightly so, because everything he touches gets LEED certification. I don't know where he is right now. I know he's somewhere here. Oh, oh everybody's pointing. <laughs> Ed, you're the best. Thank you for all you do. And he's out here in a hard hat more than he is anywhere else. Um, it's been my pleasure, my extreme pleasure, to serve on the not-for-profit board for Peoria for over 10 years. I served with Mr. Patena before he was uh, on city council. He was actually worked in the trenches with all these people uh, prior uh, to that. So he has a real heart for this. And through my service on that board, that, that not for profit board, I've come to recognize not only a lot of amazing people who help, but the people in need. And we really have, they may not all be apparent needs, but, but we all sometimes need a little help. We have lost a loved one, and we just need some support getting through that. Uh, this facility will offer that. I'm very proud to say um, that we have other special people uh, that have worked long and hard before we had this amazing facility. And I want to give kudos and special thanks to Debbie Pearson. Raise your hand. <laughs> she has been in the trenches for years, and I mean literally counting the homeless. She has been in the trenches, in the riverbeds, in the bushes, in the brambles, and so has Bill for that matter. Um, I also want to thank Karen Imig and her entire staff because I know how hard they work. If you work with a federal government agency, boy, do you put in your, your time. And they do that every day. They work with HUD. They work with Habitat for Humanity. They're absolutely dedicated. And Karen, please pass that along to your staff. They're probably here today. But if they're not, uh, please tell them that they are so much appreciated. <laughs> the groups that are coming in here will provide the very heartbeat of Peoria. They will send up a beacon high into the sky and say, this is the place to come for help. And as Habitat likes to say, not a handout, but a hand up. And I think that's what we offer here. That's what we're, we already offer, and we're going to do even a more concise job of it. Uh, we have already served thousands and thousands of people for years. Uh, but we're going to be able to serve more people in a more concise manner here. Uh, seniors, Foundation for Senior Living, Stepping It Up, Medicare Planning. Some of us are already, you know, if you're at a certain age, you need the Medicare planning, right? Uh, for kids and teens and work, the JAG program, Bloom 65, WIC, Women, Infants, and Children, the cri Child Crisis Center, uh, Jobs, JAG, Arizona at Work, Utility Assistance, which we all know the woman in Sun City passed away due to extreme heat in her home and her air conditioning had been put off. St. Vincent de Paul will be housed here and will help people with utility assistance. Um, I am proud to be a part of the solution here. I couldn't be prouder than to join all of you today 
in saying thanks to everyone who has made this happen. I can't wait to cut that ribbon. Thank you, Mary Pro Tem Hunt. Uh, yes, very proud moment. And before I introduce our last uh, council member speaker, I want to thank uh, the other council members that are here in, uh, in attendance, council member Danette Dunn and council member John Edwards. Thank you for your support. the speaker's podium. 
Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received. Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. We will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection in the Pledge of Allegiance led by Vice Mayor Finn. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlin? Here. Vice Mayor Finn? Here. Council Member Patenin? Here. Council Member Binsbacher? Here. Council Member Edwards? Here. Council Member Hunt? Here. Council Member Dunn? Here. Council Liaison Greathouse? Here. And Council Liaison Robin Drawn? Here. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of February 18th, 2020. The first item on our agenda is a very special item. Uh, this is the Constitution Contest. For the past 20 years, the City of Peoria has organized a Constitution Contest for Peoria students as a way to celebrate the United States Constitution. The purpose of the contest is to promote an understanding of the United States Constitution to school-age children Grade appropriate topics were chosen for grades K through 12, and a committee of youth advisory board members judged the entries. The City Council will recognize the students selected as first, second, and third place in each category. All winners will receive a gift card and a grand prize of a $1,500 college scholarship will be presented to a high school junior or senior. So at this time, I would like to invite our Youth Council liaisons, Ravendron and Great House, to the chamber floor, and they will announce our winners this evening. Thank you again to each of the students who have participated in the 20th celebration of the Constitutional Contest. At this time, we'll be, be calling the students in groups based on grades. When you hear, hear your name, please come forward to receive your certificate and prize. There will be a photo opportunity for our winners before moving on to the next group. Parents are welcome to come forward and take photos at that time. We will start with kindergarten. In the kindergarten category, category from Apache Elementary School, first place goes to Megan Bielman. From Apache Elementary School, second place goes to Rachel Bielman. From Ira Murphy Elementary School, third place goes to Gabriela Lopez. For the first and second grade category from Apache Elementary School, first place goes to Ryder Jones. From Legacy Traditional School, second place goes to Remney Ingram.
From Vestancia Elementary School, third place goes to Ethan Set. For the third and fourth grade category from Apache Elementary School, first place goes to Lily Torres. From Desert Harbor, second place goes to Bailey Meyer. From Skyview Elementary School, third place goes to Aliyah Donahue. Got it. <laughs> In the fifth and sixth grade category, from Skyview Elementary School, first place goes to Layla Donahue. From Frontier Elementary School, second place goes to Asher Melarongi. From Apache Elementary School, third place goes to Esteban Ariza. In the seventh and eighth grade category from Oasis Elementary School, first place goes to Mackenzie Colebrook. From Apache Elementary School, second place goes to Tuscan Zane. From Zuni Hills Elementary School, third place goes to Kimber Powell. In the ninth and 10th grade category from Sunrise Mountain High School, first place goes to Andrew Dworsak. From Centennial High School, second place goes to Elizabeth Anderson. From Centennial High School, third place goes to Deacon Warner.
in the 11th and 12th grade category from Centennial High School, first place goes to Faith Presido. From Centennial High School, second place goes to Parker Waken. And the grand prize winner is Justin Chen, a junior from at Centennial High School. Congratulations to all the winners. Thank you once again for participating in this program. At this time, students and families can exit quietly as a council meeting will resume. Thank you again for attending this, e attending this evening. And parents, thank all of you for getting your kids here and being supportive of your children. Makes all the difference, thank you. We will now proceed to the consent agenda. All items listed on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion unless a council member requests an item to be removed and considered in the normal sequence on the agenda. Tonight's consent agenda includes items that require a public hearing. If there is any member of the public present who wants to address a public hearing on the consent agenda, please complete a speaker request form and place it in the bin next to the speaker's podium. This item will be removed from consent agenda and heard during the normal course of the regular agenda. And I have received no speaker request forms to remove something from consent. Council, are there any items to be removed from consent? All right, seeing none, do I have a motion? So moved. Second. The motion and a second, please vote. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. We will now move on to new business. In the regular agenda, item 11R, naming of Neighborhood Park, 97th Drive and Williams Road. And I will turn to Mr. Tyne for a staff report. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. And in keeping with City Council policy, our Parks, Recreation, and Community Facilities Department did hold a civic engagement process to solicit names for the new neighborhood park to be constructed at 97th uh, Drive and Williams Road. And so we have with us John Sefton, Parks, Recreation, and Community Facilities Director, to talk more about the public input process and the submittal process for your consideration. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Mr. Tyne. Good evening, Mayor and Council. Yes, we do have a, a part of development in Peoria is that we often uh, are blessed with the opportunity to develop parks. Uh, this developer-driven uh, uh, park uh, is located uh, this is a map of our uh, park assets throughout the community and right here where that fancy star is flipping around is where uh, the next park will be officially named. It is in the community of the Meadows and uh, as uh, Jeff had mentioned, we are going to mention that the uh, outreach, public outreach process was pretty extensive. We held a, uh, in partnership with the engineering department, a public meeting on April 18th to talk about the design concepts and the construct of the park. 
Uh, from that, the Parks and Recreation Board held public discussion meetings uh, for that amenity and to drive the de design and the development on June 20th and September 19th of 2019. Uh, at that point, uh, the Parks and Recreation Board was engaged and uh, they asked that we uh, reach out to the community via a web form. We had a web form available uh, and promoted through social media as well as the HOAs uh, from October 14th through November 11th. And we received a total of 86 nominations. Wow. Most were serious, a couple were joke-like. <laughs> uh, Parky McParkface made the list again. Um, but uh, that's what happens when you let the internet uh, contribute, right? So staff presented this list to the board for discussion on, at uh, the November 21st and December 19th meetings. Uh, the board uh, narrowed down their list. I do want to take a moment and recognize those uh, board members that are in attendance. Jerry Johnson, Barry, Terry, or sorry, Tony Van Gotham and Rich Ward are all here tonight. Thank you, gentlemen. It's your fault. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, so then also on uh, January 23rd, they made the final action to put forward uh, a finalist name. So we utilize the process. The park uh, has come out with a really solid design of, of focusing on our recreation amenities. Something unique for this park will be the uh, LED lit ball field, uh, the multi-purpose ball field that you see there. And uh, per the policy and the naming, uh, your formal act tonight is to pick one of the five names or send us back to the drawing board. So with that, I'll do my best to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Council, are there any questions? I have a question. Yes. Council John, member. can you tell me if, uh, like, number one, Liberty Park, number five, Thunderstone, were those done, uh, like, in popularity? Was, are they listed in the way they're most popular? Mayor Councilman Burpaten, a great question. No, they are <laughs> not. It was very intentional that they did not submit these as a rank order. Uh, they, we went through a very deliberate process in identifying these, uh, and they did not, and the policy does not require that, so this is uh, points rather than numbers on purpose. Thank you. Any further comments or questions? Comment. Yes, Councilmember Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, John, I just want to thank you and staff, and especially the 86 participants in the in the community that took the time to fill out this form. I mean, this is really civic engagement, really wanting to get involved in their local community. So I just want to thank you for the outreach that you made possible to the residents. Thank you. Councilmember Hunt. I'm probably not as familiar with that area as I should be, but is this not, or is this close to Liberty High School? Is it on the Mayor, same? Council Member Hunt, yes. Uh, okay. Probably within a quarter of a mile of Liberty High School. Okay, so it's on the same road and? Mm -hmm. Slightly off of the same road. It's, okay. it's just around the corner, Okay, if you will. just in my mind was wanting to locate it. Thanks. So that being said, do I have a motion to proceed with a particular name? Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to adopt uh, Liberty Park as our choice. Second. We have a motion and a second for Liberty Park. Is there any further comments or discussion? Seeing none, then we will vote on Liberty Park as the name. And Liberty Park is the name of our new park. So it is. That's wonderful. Thank you Thanks to our Parks and Rec Board for all of your work. We will now move on to item 12R, Fletcher Heights Planned Area Development Amendment, Cobblestone Auto Spa, 83rd Avenue and Deer Valley Road. Staff report, Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you. And Chris Hawkes, Planning Director, will present uh, a planned area development amendment for your consideration. I'll pass it to Mr. Hawkes. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Tyne, and good evening, Mayor and Council. Um, item 12R, this is a proposed major amendment to the Fletcher Heights Planned Area Development Zoning. Uh, this was filed by M3 Design on behalf of Auto, uh, Cobblestone Auto Spa. So the applicant in this case proposes to modify the land use table by adding standalone car wash as a permitted conditional use in this zoning district. 
If approved, the applicant would then seek to obtain a conditional use permit for a car wash facility. Um, ultimately, they desire to redevelop the northeast corner of 83rd Avenue and, and Deer Valley Road. Uh, currently at that corner is a vacant Valero gas station, so they would be seeking to raise the existing gas station and build a new car wash facility. Mayor and Council, during the course of this uh, case, we've received input from the public pertaining to the proposed cobblestone auto spall or some specific site-related concerns like traffic congestion and noise. And so for the benefit of those that may be in attendance tonight, I wanted to talk about the application and make a distinction between what we're considering tonight and uh, if it got past the uh, conditional use permit. So tonight we're answering uh, the land use question, and rather that is, should a standalone car wash be an allowed use in the Fletcher Heights planned area development? So a planned area development, what is that? That's a zoning category uh, for the area. It tells us the allowable uses for that area. It also tells us all the development standards. Each planned area development is different and are tailored to the area, okay? So if the planned area development amendment was to be approved that allows the car wash use, we would then nextly and separately address the specific operational and site characteristics through what's called a conditional use permit. Uh, this is a separate application that would go before the Planning and Zoning Commission at a later date. Uh, the CUP evaluates things like traffic, access, lighting, noise, odor, hours of operation, and those types of things. And through the conditional use permit, we have the ability to impose conditions to mitigate uh, any of those negative impacts. So again, tonight's the land use question uh, related to the PD amendment. If it was to be approved, the next step would be to look at a conditional use permit. Um, before we talk about the proposed amendment, uh, let's review the Fletcher Heights PAD. Okay, you can see on the screen, I think you can make out the uh, outline, it's outlined in red, but the Fletcher Heights PAD, this was a master plan that was approved by the council back in 1995. This was 793 acre master plan or about 1.2 square miles. Um, it consisted of a variety of different parcels, uh, park, school, a uh, variety of residential parcels and some commercial parcels. Uh, more specifically, what I've tried to do is identify the four commercial parcels on the screen, and they're denoted in the red dot. So you have the southeast corner of Lake Pleasant Parkway and 83rd Avenue. Uh, that's a quick trip and various commercial uses. There's the northeast corner of Lake Pleasant and Parkway and 83rd. That was the former Safeway, now a, I think a Goodwill and a Planet Fitness. There's a northwest corner of Deer Valley Road and 75th. That's a smaller parcel. That's a quick trip there. And then the northeast corner of the Deer Valley Road and 83rd Avenue, that's an Albertson's uh, anchored grocery center. Okay, so for those commercial parcels, I'm going to zero in on that part of the PAD, but the, the, for the commercial parcels, the PAD has specific standards. Uh, the PAD allows any use that is permitted within the city's PC2 district or planned commercial district plus some stated addition. So hang on, I'll talk about PC2 in a second. <laughs> Um, but uh, let's talk about the, one of those stated additions that I just mentioned. Um, the PAD does allow for gas service station and some ancillary um, types of uses in conjunction with that gas service station. Things like, as you can see on the screen, uh, automatic car wash, lubrication facilities, tire repair, uh, muffler repair, and, and so forth. Um, uh, when the PAD was established in 1995, uh, the car wash was typically an added amenity to the gas station. So staff has interpreted this provision to mean that a car wash would be permitted in the PAD if it was developed in conjunction with a gas service station. So tonight uh, the, the request is to uh, propose that uh, car wash as a standalone use be, put, uh, be provided into the PAD document. Oops. All right, let's talk about the, the, the specific area context. Um, so again, we're talking about the proposal to modify the land use table to allow car wash as a standalone use. Um, again, we're talking about, uh, they're looking specifically at the northeast corner of 83rd and Deer Valley, where, but however, just note that if this approval did occur, this would be a use that would be allowed at any of the four corners, any of the four commercial parcels in the, in the city, or in the, in the PAD rather. So we look at the site context, again, the northeast corner, that's a grocery anchored center that's uh, anchored by an Albertsons. There's also fast food and various inline commercial services that you would typically expect at this type of corner. Uh, the southwest corner of this intersection is uh, anchored by a Fry's grocery store, 
also includes a gas station, fast food, and some other inline commercial services. And then the northwest corner is um, a mix of commercial uses. There isn't an anchor, but it's, uh, there are restaurants, a break plus, Walgreens, and an urgent care. So now what I'm gonna show you is the zoning map for the area. So again, the northeast corner, uh, that's part of the PAD. Um, the northwest corner and southwest corner are not part of the PAD. Those are zoned C2 or intermediate commercial. Uh, the northeast corner that's part of the PAD, um, that PAD points to the PC2 districts. So I'll talk about that now and what that distinction is. So first off, the C2 zoning district, um, that's the city's most common commercial district. So if you imagine uh, most mile intersections across the city, or particularly in the, in the more turbid parts of the city, those are probably zoned C2. C2 allows for a, a whole uh, host of uses. This is a zoning category that is similar, but slightly more intense than the PC2 districts. I'll talk about that in a minute. And, and I would say probably the main difference between the PC2 district and the C2 district is the, uh, some of the auto-related uses that are allowed in C2 are not allowed in PC2. So let me show you a graphic here. So on the screen, this is all of the commercial zoning districts that we have in our zoning district. And so the way they're ordered is at the top, office commercial, that's the least intense commercial district or most restrictive. And at the bottom, C5 regional commercial, most intense and most permissive zoning district. So you can see where C2 and PC2 land. They're in the middle. They're essentially designed to uh, respond to more neighborhood level commercial opportunities or what you see at your mile intersection. So on the right, I want to draw a little bit of distinction between the PC2 and the C2 zoning district. So some of those uses that you see in the yellow box, those are uses that are not permitted in the PC2 district, but permitted in the C2. So you can see there's a little bit of distinction between the two. They're predominantly, I would say, um, surrounding auto-related uses. That's the, I would say, the primary distinction between those two. When we looked at this case that, uh, when it came in, uh, staff uh, made some observations about, about the case. Um, we did note that while there are some minor distinctions, PC2 and C2 are very similar zoning districts. Um, we also noted that the PAD currently allows car washes, but again, as I mentioned, only in conjunction with gas stations. That's the only way they're allowed. And arguably, and, 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 and fairly, this is, this is a debatable point, but the gas stations and car wash have a similar character, similar intensity. Um, they have similar traffic generation and lighting, but Again, I, I understand there, there certainly could be a debatable point. Um, and stepping back, when we look at the commercial parcels, when we consider particularly the northeast corner of 83rd and Deer Valley or the other uh, two commercial parcels that I noted at Lake Pleasant Parkway and 83rd, they have a pretty similar character, I would say, to um, 83rd Deer Valley, the southwest corner, and some prominent C2 corners across the city. There's some similarity in character there. All right, so let's talk about the public process. Uh, we have a public process that unfolded, as you know. Um, we send out a notice of application when the case came in, and, uh, and later on, notice of hearing that goes to all property owners within a 600-foot radius, and that radius was taken from the area of impact, uh, which was the northeast corner of 83rd and Deer Valley, and we also sent it to all registered HOAs within a one-mile radius. And as you can see, we published the paper and, and post on the site. We do require a neighborhood meeting. Uh, that was held at Sunset Heights Elementary on December 3rd. Uh, we had one attendee at the meeting. The attendee uh, had some questions, as I understand, on the, the cleaning product, the, the cleaning solution that was used. Um, throughout the course of the project, we have received one opposition email, and that, per, that email noted uh, perceived uh, concerns with expansion and traffic congestion in the area given the, uh, the car wash use that would be coming in. This case did go to the Planning and Zoning Commission on January 16th. Uh, we had one speaker present. Uh, the speaker that's at the Planning and Zoning Commission, noise was the chief concern that that person uh, uh, spoke of. Uh, that person also supplied an email that was signed uh, by four other persons that were in opposition to that case. So, um, as I indicated on the prior slide, some of the key findings that staff identified are on the screen. We just noted some of the similarities and uh, the personality of the different intersections and, and some of the uses. Um, and with that, our recommendation and the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission is to approve the amendment. Um, and then as I note on the screen, there are other options um, 
to consider as well. And so with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. Council members, are there any questions? All right, seeing none, um, I do have a number of speaker request forms. And in addition to that, I would also like to say that we have received um, here at our, at our dais um, 14 different letters in opposition. So I would like to make sure that those are part of our um, permanent record here. And I will move on to speaker request forms. And when I call your name, if you would kindly come to the speaker's podium and state your name and address for the record, you will have three minutes to speak. And we will start with Vicki Bernhardt. Ms. Bernhardt, are you here? That's the place, thank you. My name is Vicki Bernhardt. I live at 8101 West Carlotta in Peoria. Mm -hmm. And I've just recently become aware of the proposed, is it cobblestone um, car wash? Yes it is. And I've really given that some thought and therefore I'm here at this meeting tonight to say that I very much object to the rezoning at 83rd and Deer Valley for that purpose. I just feel like it will add, again, the noise factor and the traffic is already terrible at that intersection. I avoid it at all costs. I feel like a car wash will just add significantly to that traffic situation. And additionally, I just feel that it won't add to the, the look and the feel, and I just heard the word personality of our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Ms. Teresa Wiest. Please come to the speaker's podium. You have three minutes to speak. State your name and address for the record. Okay. Hello, Mayor Carlott and Councilman. I came to the meeting the other night for the zoning, so I was the one person here, and I think that that probably was because none of us were really notified ahead of time. I only found out the day before. So it's hard to get everybody notified, I know, but when once our neighbors discovered what was happening, I walked the neighborhood with my dog and talked to lots of neighbors, and I heard no one that wanted the car wash there. They were all opposed. And I think, as Vicki said, it just changes the flavor of our neighborhood. It's noisy. When I walk in the evenings, it's quiet. So I would appreciate your taking um, our comments, and we really oppose that. I also have two other statements for neighbors that couldn't come tonight. The first one is from Jennifer. Yenrich, my name is Jennifer Yenrich and I live at 8037 West Sands Drive. My husband and I are opposed to the zoning change that will allow for a car wash on our corner. Although we cannot attend the meeting, we would like our opinion to be noted. The next one is from Janet Day. She lives on um, Sands, West Sands Drive. I am opposed to the car wash going in at Deer Valley and 83rd Avenue because of the noise involved with the operation of this business. My husband and I purchased our home in this area specifically because it was a still, was and still is a quiet neighborhood. So I think that's kind of the feeling of the neighbors that it will really change the whole flavor and ambiance of our neighborhood. I'm an original owner and we purchased there because of how the zoning was in the neighborhood. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your comments. Okay, um, I have another speaker request form for Gordon Manum. Did I say that right? If you would please state your name and address for the record, you have Thank three you. minutes. Thank you. My name is Gordon Mandit. Uh, we live at 8043 West Sands Drive. Um, and my wife, thank you 
for uh, listening to our comments tonight. My wife and I live on the northeast corner of, of 83rd Avenue in Deer Valley, uh, actually right behind the Albertsons Plaza mm -hmm. that we're talking about. We've lived in the area for over 15 years um, and just really love the neighborhood and similar to what Vicki and Terry have said, uh, you know, we, we moved there for a reason because it was a nice quiet neighborhood um, and really, uh, really liked the ambiance of the neighborhood. Um, it has recently been brought to our attention that the cobblestone car wash is in the process of seeking approval to rezone and build a car wash at that corner of 83rd Avenue in Deer Valley. Um, and I'm here just to state that we are, we are opposed to the rezoning of that pad to allow for the construction of a three-story car wash. Um, main concern is that the car wash is going to cause additional traffic and congestion through what is an already very busy intersection um, and make it even more difficult to get in and out, in and out of the businesses. Uh, on, quite frankly, all four, four corners of that intersection. Um, uh, that intersection, I'm sure you know, already has its fair share of accidents, um, and building a car wash will bring in even more traffic, which could quite possibly result in even more accidents. Both of my teenage children travel uh, through the intersection on their way to and from school every day, and um, you know their safety is, is of our utmost concern. Um, and then just additionally, one more thing, I think the, the excessive noise of bringing in a car wash with just the, the <coughs> extra cars and the washers and the blowers and the vacuums and everything that come with that is just really gonna, gonna destroy the, the, the area and the neighborhood. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you for your comments. Uh, next, <coughs> Jill Creed. If you would please state your name and address for the record, you have three minutes to speak. My name is Jill Creed. I live at 8119 West Via Del Sol. And my personal opposition to this comes to the fact that we live at Deer Valley Road behind, I always call it Fletcher Tire, but it's not that anymore. <laughs> but so our house is really right in the line of fire. And the, already the noise from the tire store, we hear it all the time. We knew that buying the house. We've been in the neighborhood for 13 years, but in this house for five. And we like the neighborhood enough that we moved into the same house just around the corner <laughs> to stay in, but just for the, a different yard. Um, nervous, sorry. Um, I echo everybody else's sentiments. It's the same, it's noise, it's traffic. I don't think it will enhance the neighborhood. I don't think it's needed. I feel that we see car washes going in everywhere. It's not necessary for our neighborhood. Um, and I also am a little bit concerned with changing a zoning and what that does in the future if the car wash goes out of business. Then now the zoning's changed, what now is allowed. I know he, that was a list of things that now could be allowed that would not be allowed now. So it's just something to consider for the future. So that's pretty much all I have. Is, I'm similar to everyone else, but thank you. All right, thank you. Um, Jill Malag. Malag, all right. Can you please just state your name and address yes. for the record? You have three minutes to speak. Good evening, Mayor and members of the council. Thank you so much for giving me the time to speak tonight. I'm Jill Malarani. My address is 8003 Malarani. West Alex Avenue, and I'm speaking to you as an involved member of my community and a 20-year resident. I'm also an original owner of Fletcher Heights. I'm here to express great concern about the construction and zoning of the Cobblestone Express car wash. Put simply, this business does not meet the needs of our community. We already have five car washes within a three mile radius, and this establishment does not provide the type of employment that will keep our community strong. It would give three to four minimum wage shift earners per shift, and while I consider myself a pro-business person, this type of investment will not meet the long-term needs of our community. I truly appreciate you taking the time to deliberate this tonight, and I know you'll make the right choice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for your comments and for pronouncing your name for me. <laughs> um, Deborah Souther, please state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Debbie Souther, and my address is 8062 West Sands Drive. I am new to the north side of Deer Valley, but I also want to express my concern over this car wash going in. I am within 600 feet of the proposed car wash, and I'm not interested in hearing the noisy blowers and the vacuums going. Um, I would love to see a new business come in that would be a local business, maybe a restaurant, which we all could use some more of those up in our area. So I am very much opposed um, 
and just really hope you take this into consideration that our neighborhood is a nice, quiet, safe neighborhood up there, and we don't need the extra traffic. We don't need extra, you know, noise in that area right now. That it's already a busy intersection, as everyone else has stated. So, thank you very much. Thank you. And Dale Bischoff. Dale, if you would correct your name for me and um, state your gonna, address. You I was going to misspell it just so that you would get it right. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I appreciate you, that. You got pretty close. My name is Dale Bischoff. I'm a resident of the Fletcher Heights community on Alex Avenue. Our home is, is uh, located directly across the street from the proposed location of the car wash. Um, we, as well as several of our neighbors, have uh, young children and our backyards back up right, right to where the the spray of the car wash would probably be wafting toward our, our yards. Our children love to play outside. Um, and we have a concern about just the, the health factor of those chemicals um, being generated into the air um, around um, our children. And so um, I composed an email to um, uh, Mr. Jesse Macias um, on November 27th. And um, I, I told him my concerns. And I said, um, you know, th these are our concerns. Would you please provide me a list of, uh, a detailed list of the chemicals that are, that are being used um, at, at your facility? And so uh, he responded to my email uh, very graciously, courteously. He attached a letter from Cobblestone's senior chemist, Mark Weiss. Unfortunately, the, the information contained in the letter um, was not the detailed chemical content that I asked for. It was just a, a form letter with a rather simplistic generalization. Um, and I quote, our product contains the same chemicals that are used to manufacture the most common household cleaners. Furthermore, the letter asserts, our products do not contain any toxic chemicals. However, in the very next sentence, he goes on to say, as with any product, including household cleaners, care and safety to prevent bodily exposure are necessary. Unfortunately, the letter provides no details about what kind of care should be exercised in connection with the chemicals that are apparently not toxic, but preventing <coughs> exposure is necessary. Um, it seems common enough knowledge to, to us that um, common household cleaners do in fact have um, chemicals that are harmful to the body and that children shouldn't necessarily be exposed to those things. So um, in that email, uh, Mr. Macias CC'd uh, Mr. Tuck Betton, a representative of Cobblestone. Um, so I responded to the email to them both, to both Mr. Macias and Mr. Betton. I said, I, I asked for a detailed list of ingredients. If your intentions are to be transparent with the neighbors, please provide the list we're asking for. I received no reply to this email. On Tuesday night, uh, December 3rd, the meeting for the neighbors of Fletcher Heights took place at Sunset Heights Elementary School, where I saw Mr. Macias, and, um, and I reiterated my concerns, and he promised to send me the information I requested. Um, and, and he said it should come within a day or two. I never received the said email. I, by the way, was the only homeowner who attended the meeting. Um, on December 19th, a few weeks later, or more than two weeks later, I wrote a follow-up email addressed both, again, to Mr. Macias of three, uh, M3 Design and Mr. Betton of Cobblestone, reminding them I still had not received the information requested. To this day, I have not received a reply for the information I requested. Our experience of Mr. Macias, Mr. Benton, Mr. Weiss, and the cobblestone car wash they represent is one of unwillingness to be open or transparent with our community concerning the impact it will have on the neighborhood and on our children. We would like to hear creative solutions suggested for the corner as an alternative. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. I have received no other um, Speaker request forms. Is there any other members of the public who would like to speak to this item? All right, seeing none. Council, is there any further? Uh, yes, sir. On the advocate. Would you please? 
uh, come down and state your name and address. You have three minutes to speak. Thank you, Jesse Macias, M3 Design, um, representing Cobblestone. Thank you again, Council, for uh, the opportunity. Um, so very quickly, I just want to again thank staff for their diligence and assistance going through the process. Um, I just want to reiterate <clears throat> that tonight in front of you, specifically what's in front of you is the language for the PAD to allow for a standalone car wash. And I know there was early on, there was some confusion about allowing this car wash by right, <clears throat> but I think it was attached to the, the gas station. Um, you know, we could go into specifics and, and I do want to address uh, very quickly the neighbors. Um, but one of the things that staff and, and, and us worked very, very hard on this was that we would have the PAD amendment and then we would have an opportunity to have the conditional use permit hearings for PNZ and City Council in front of you again. <coughs> and with that, we would then hold a second neighborhood meeting with the neighbors. And, and I know there was some confusion. The, the neighbor that came to the PNZ last time uh, indicated that she was not notified and so forth. Um, she was actually outside of the radius. She was like 1,350 feet or so. Um, but again, we would hold a um, a, a second neighborhood meeting to be able to to have a discussion with the neighbors and then we would be able to have an opportunity to specifically address you know noise and so forth <clears throat> I do want to reiterate that we're replacing a vacant eyesore that's been vacant we are replacing a gas station that was 24 hour with uh, with the beer and wine and and gas um, so what we understand is that a, a gas station could actually come in and be able to, by right, open that facility. And that would be a 24 hour, and in our opinion, that's a much more invasive use. We are not 24 hour, we're actually 7 a.m. to 8 p.m. Um, as far as noise, all our equipment are internalized. Our motors are internalized, so there's literally no noise at the pay points, and then as far as the dryers, those are internalized as well. Uh, the decibel level is much less than the ambient noise from the traffic. Um, and, and noise travels vertically. Um, so every, every 10 feet, the decibel level drops by five. So by the time you, you reach the neighborhood to the north, ambient is, is probably um, like a normal conversation that we would be having. And we strategically located the, the car wash so that it faced to the north, right to the street, which is adjacent to the ambient noise instead of the neighborhood to the south. So again, um, that was one of the things that we would have an opportunity to still be in front of PNZ and city council specifically on the use. And again, we would, we would hold the second neighborhood meeting with all the neighbors that are in, in attendance. And Mr. Bishop, I really apologize because I did send out a second email with a much more detailed report from the vendor, and I apologize. I'm not sure why he didn't receive it. Um, but we do, we do have a, everything's biodegradable. Um, everything is contained. We have a sand oil separator. So everything is contained within our building. So again, with that, I would be happy to answer any questions. And again, we, we look forward to your approval. And again, we'll, we'll have an opportunity to have a, a process specifically on the use. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Are there any questions, Council, for the um, developer? All right, thank you. Okay, just to clarify, we are this evening voting on a PAD change. And that is all we are doing, voting on a planned area development change. Planned area developments are for the purpose of, of being specific to their site, you know, conforming to what the residents, the community, the neighbors want. That's what we have currently. So is there any question at all about what we're voting on? Okay. Um, then any comments or do I have a motion? Yes, Council Member Hunt. Thank you so much to the neighbors who have taken the time to come out tonight. I do want to say that 
most of you, if not all of you, were notified. It's so easy to miss that, but that's part of what our planning and zoning does. So I think I applaud the lady, I think it's Teresa or Terry, who went door to door to the neighbors to get them to express the feeling. Um, I try, as a council member, never to approve something that I wouldn't want in my neighborhood. I don't live up there. I live right behind City Hall here, and we don't have a car wash close. But I would not want that in my neighborhood. I understand, I think you're probably the most coherent group we've ever had speak here. Nobody stomped or lost their temper or yelled at us or anything. I frankly am surprised that it got to us. I feel it should have been. I wish you guys had been able to go to the other meetings to squelch it at an earlier space. I will not vote for this because frankly, I just wouldn't want it in my neighborhood. And I think you people have a right to have the lifestyle, the, the way you want to live there without everything you've described. So thank you and sorry to the Thank you, Councilmember Patena. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, first of all, Chris, I wanna thank you and your staff for working so hard uh, to prepare this presentation tonight and also um, preparing the Planning and Zoning Commission with all the information that you uh, were able to get. So I have been at this job on City Council for a little over seven years. And I can recall only one other time that this council didn't go along with a plan, with a uh, border or a commission. So that tells me that we take the recommending border commission, which the Planning and Zoning Committee is, very, very seriously. I would say that 99% of the time we agree with what they want. But each of us up here on this council are responsible for about 30,000 people. And this council has always tried to do what is best for the citizens and for the city. I don't think that this project passes that test. And I'm also concerned about the traffic. I, I'm in that area quite often. Um, I shop at the Albertsons. I make a right-hand turn out of the Albertsons onto Deer Valley. Sometimes I have to wait two lights because the traffic is backed up all the way from the light past the uh, entrance to the Albertsons or that shopping center. Same thing happens when I go to turn left onto 83rd. You have to wait two or three lights because the traffic is, is just too much. So I, uh, th the last thing I wanna say is, I know that our city has a very robust uh, design review program that, that the city is very proud of. I saw the rendering of the building <clears throat> and it didn't excite me very much. So, uh, I, I don't think that I'm going to be able to vote yes on this. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Are there any other comments? Mayor. Yes, Councilmember Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I want to echo Vicki's comments to the neighbors. It's uh, very admirable for you to come out and speak this evening. I know that we took time out of your busy uh, schedule to come out and speak, and it wasn't just right down the street to speak. You had to come all the way to City Hall. but. When I became aware of this uh, proposal, car, the pros car wash, I had my initial reservations. I did meet with the developer. After the PNZ meeting, I, re I got some phone calls and some emails from some residents voicing their concern and wanting to meet with me. I have met with as many residents as I possibly could, and the common theme is they don't want this in their backyard. Uh, they moved in this area for a reason, for the peace and quiet. They knew the zoning that was currently in place. It did not allow a standalone car wash. It does allow a car wash if it's attached to a, a gas station, but it specifically states no car wash standing alone. So there's a reason for that. When they initially did the, P, uh, the PAD, I believe, how many years ago, Chris? 24 years ago? 1995. Yeah. Uh, 25. So there was a reason for it, and I don't see any reason that we change the aesthetics of the community uh, to anything different at this point. I want to thank staff for their work. I want to thank PNZ for their work because I know it's difficult getting all the facts and making decisions, not having all of the, the data. Uh, but I, I, I commend you and staff for, for doing your homework. But based on the public comments and my understanding of the impacts, 
I can't go along and support this project. So Mayor, I would motion that we deny ordinance 2024-004 for the Fletcher Heights plan development amendment at Cobblestone at 83rd and Deer Valley. Second. Thank you. I have a motion and a second to deny. Council, please vote. Yes. Also denying is, it's yes. It's done. Yes. Denying is yes. Denying is yes. Sorry. Do you want do you want to fix that? Okay. Can he fix it? Start over. All right. So revote. We're all voting again. Yes, we're all voting again. Thank you, Councilmember Patena. And it passes unanimously to deny. Thank you again for all of your comments and contributions. All right, the next item on the agenda is call to the public for non-agenda items. And I do have one speaker request form from Nanette Shelton. Shelton, if you will come to the speaker's podium, state your name and address for the record, please. I'm Nanette Shelton. I live at 173749th. I have been a resident here for two years now. Uh, I don't know if you remember, I was a new resident the first time I spoke and I couldn't tell you what my address was. So <laughs> I do know my address now. Um, I am so delighted to be a member of this community and what I just witnessed, I hope that everybody watches it on television. It was inspiring. I'm just so proud to be a part of this community and so proud of what the mayor and council does here. I went to the 4th of July event at P83 Sports. I don't know all the right words. I'm sorry, but it was fabulous. Got a fire hat for a grandson. It was just the fireworks, the food, everything about it was wonderful. I love the way Bell Road looks with the lights and the new landscaping. It's just a community that is clean and kind and good, and I am so happy here. <laughs> and I didn't know that would happen. But I'm actually here to talk about, I had gone to the grocery store last Sunday, and when I came out of the grocery store, there was a police car and several people kind of standing around, and I kind of looked and thought, nah, I don't think that's got anything to do with me. So I put my groceries in the car, and then realized that it did have something to do with me. And a lady had backed out and scraped the side of my car. She was so upset, so kind, and in opposition to what they do in California, she stayed there. I have been the victim of two hit and runs, so you know that she stayed and she was so kind. But the chief of police and I came to this city about the same time, so I feel like he's kind of a member of my family. <laughs> So here these policemen are, and I'm delighted to see them. Yay, we have policemen. <coughs> so they do all their stuff, and they give me the neatest thing ever. It's an information exchange. This piece of paper has everything on it about the lady, her phone number, her insurance, me, phone numbers, insurance. And thanks to Seth back there, I learned that the policeman was Wayne Newman. I knew his last name was Newman. Um, and there was another gentleman there. And then while they were there, the citizens patrol came up, two very nice gentlemen who just wanted to make sure everything was under control and that we weren't having a riot or any traffic problems. And they were assured that we were all calm, cool, and collected, and they left. But I was just standing there feeling, this, this is my chief of police's kids, and they're doing a great <laughs> job. And I just wanted you to know, because it just seems like we don't hear very much of the good stuff. The lady who was sitting next to me, her son won a first place award, and she said, well, what are you doing here? Are you going to complain about something? No! <laughs> I'm going to say I am so happy here, and thank you for all your hard work and what you do. We're richly blessed by all of you. Thank you. Thank My you. goodness. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming to our meeting this evening. What a wonderful way to end our evening.
Yes, please come back anytime. <laughs> okay, we will now move on to reports from the city manager, Mr. Tyne. Thank you, Mayor and Council, and I cannot top that conversation, yeah. so I'm going to pass it over to Council. Thank you. Okay. All right, we will start with Youth Council Liaison Raventron. So first, I'd like to congratulate all the winners of um, the Constitution Contest. You all did amazing. Um, last week at our Youth Advisory Board meeting, Council Member Edwards actually came and spoke about the Heart Pantry, and, how, and, they, and he expressed that they wanted to reconnect the teen community and they wanted more teen involvement. And so um, the Youth Advisory Board, or someone from representing them, are going to go to one of their meetings and kind of talk about their, their activities. Um, also, at the last council meeting, Bloom 365 came and spoke about teen dating violence. And at my school, Mountain Ridge, um, a lot of people were orange on that Friday to support the cause. And that's all I have. That is Thank great. You. And, you know, we lit City Hall orange for that day, too. Thank you. Council Member Dunn? I wanted to let everybody know there's a public open house of, um, on the Northern <coughs> Parkway, Agua Fria River to 99th Avenue, um, talking about the expansion of the 303. And that's going to be Tuesday, February 25th uh, from 5 to 7, and it'll be held at Country Meadows Elementary. So it's a good uh, opportunity for those um, to weigh in. They'll have some design choices. Um, let's you know attend and participate because it does make a difference on on what we're going to do and they have a lot of good choices there so um i'd like to uh, see anybody that can come out to to be able to do that on the 25th i i did want to also mention we had the pine advisory committee last week and it's it's growing we were up we doubled in size now we're up to 26 uh, uh people from the district and it, it, it's very engaging and productive. We had uh, one of our own Peoria firefighters who attended, who lives in the district, and we connected, because it's their group, it's, it's their, their district, we connected him with a, a business, uh, one of the Peoria auto dealerships, and they're helping each other on a project um, on a little a park. The firefighter had noticed the kids were getting burned on the equipment, and so the dealership is offering to kind of come in and put some money into it. So. That's really what this was uh, for, um, everybody helping each other. Uh, Chief Miller was gracious to come out and speak to uh, the committee and very well received, a lot of good information. Um, talked about HOA, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, neighborhood watches mm -hmm. and things that uh, we could do together to all lock arms and, and kind of um, you know community police as well. Um, I did want to uh, thank the mayor. I, she um, was gracious. Um, she, she had put in um, for businesses of the month, restaurants mm -hmm. of the month, and I, I'm so grateful to you, Mayor, for doing this because it was a chance for us to recognize our very important businesses throughout uh, Peoria. So uh, Touchdown uh, was one of the businesses that we went to, and um, Channel uh, 11, our, our station, and, and Jen Stein, thank you for all the great work that you do in, in helping us get the word out. And we also wanted to recognize, and did recognize, Carolina's uh, Mexican restaurant. So thank you, Mayor, for doing that uh, yeah. for the community and for us as the council members representing the, the, that district. Um, I did want to show, um, we, we discussed last council meeting POGO, the new transit and the new schedule. And staff has worked so hard. We brought that to the advisory committee. I can't tell you how many great comments I got from the citizens. I mean, they're so excited about being able to travel to, to different parts of Peoria and all of us as Peoria as one. And it really is the, all the work, hard work that our staff has put together and, and putting this together. It is uniting us as a community and it makes me really happy. You might notice these uh, that have been going up along uh, we have them on Long Northern, uh, Park West, and peppered throughout the city. There are new signs, and really what I wanted to do um, is, is show that, you know, we are proud of our city, the quality of life, you know, um, the inclusivity uh, of our city. And um, if you get a chance, take a long, uh, drive along uh, uh, Northern, and you can see these, and they also have some over by the Home Depot area as well. So thank you again, staff, for putting this together. I really appreciate the hard work, and 
It's making a difference. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Hunt. <clears throat> thank you, Mayor. Um, first of all, thank you so much for the kind words. I'm going to just float home tonight. That'll, that's great. And I, I also really want to thank, again, uh, the neighbors who came and exercised their rights as community members and, and they're really their obligation to engage. If it's important to them, they need to let us know it. Um, I want to congratulate the Constitution winners and especially the four from Centennial High School. I know, having been an English teacher, what a sacrifice it is to take time out of your uh, required curriculum to help students focus on something additional that will touch their hearts and uh, be important to them and especially to the young man who won uh, the college money. Mm -hmm. uh, this past week, I went with John here. We each purchase bus passes that we donate to the Flex Academy at Peoria High School because so many of the students don't li at Flex Academy that attend. It's, a, it's an alternative school within the Peoria High School boundaries. They, they are in Old Main. Uh, they don't have the money to ride the bus to get to school, and they don't live within walking distance. So therefore, their attendance record sometimes can be a little, a little shady. So we donate bus passes to allow them to, uh, to not miss school. The, 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 they're given to the principals, and they're given to the students then at the principal's discretion. But um, I love, I always be, love being at Peoria High School anyway, and especially when I can uh, do something like that. So that's all I have. Thank you. Um, Council Member Edwards. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Um, on the 11th uh, last week, Vicki and I, we attended the uh, PUSD Smart Center <coughs> ribbon cutting over at the former Challenger Center. And what an awe inspiring event that was to see this building transformed into a new learning facility for the arts within the PUSD district. And it was just an honor to be there and got to do a tour of what the new facility is looking like. It's not completely built out yet, but it's got some great things to come. And so I just really want to thank Vicki for going with me and to PUSD for inviting us to, to join in that event as Vicki stated uh, we went to Flex Academy I, I think it was I, th I think you're right it's so important to be able to give an opportunity for students that may not be able to get to school an opportunity to get to school and, and if it means a, just a small donation to give them a bus pass for a day or a week or a month to get them to school <coughs> um, I'm all in because I do not want kids missing school because I can't get to school. So I want to thank you, Vicki, for making me aware of the program, and I gladly donated. Um, last week, I, I went to the uh, Sunrise Library and partook in the Let's Have a Dog Party uh, by a local, uh, local author, Michaela Provost, uh, wrote a book, and so she was there signing it, and uh, some residents brought their dogs in, so it was interactive with kids. They read the story, they got to pet the dogs, a little interaction, they got prizes, so it was just, I want to thank the friends of the library, John and your team, thank you so much for, for making that event go on. And then lastly, um, this last weekend, I had a phenomenal opportunity to go to the Devour uh, festival down here at City Hall. What a phenomenal event. I want to thank staff, John, Mary Lou, uh, Marilyn, you guys just rocked it. You guys had some of the best food and the entertainment was just superb. So I hope this becomes an annual event down here uh, because and everybody, everybody that I spoke to really in, enjoyed the event. And then lastly, to echo Vicki's comments, um, I, I want to thank the residents of Fletcher Heights that did come out and speak because it is important. It's your, your city and we are uh, here to listen to you. And so if you ever have a question or a concern, please don't hesitate to reach out to us because that's what we're here to do. So I just want to thank them again for coming out and taking time out of their busy day. So that's all I have. Thank you. Vice Mayor Finn. Thank you, Mayor. A couple of comments. Congratulations to the uh, Constitution Award winners. If people didn't notice, that was probably the best Pledge of Allegiance this chambers has ever had with all of them in here. So <laughs> I thought that was great. Uh, reminder to Palo Verde District, um, constituents bulk uh, trash pickup starts March 2nd in the district. So please check the map online for, um, for when that pickup will be. Uh, I, I concur with John's comments on Devour the World, so in the interest of brevity, I won't uh, repeat all of that. And finally, my heartfelt condolences out to um, Officer Kellywood's family up in Pine Top Sholo. The officer lost his life over the, uh, 
or the, the other evening, and uh, it's just a reminder that our first responders have no idea what they're walking into. They're out there to protect us, and we thank them for everything that they do. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'd like to congratulate all the Constitution winners. Uh, Ma'am, I want to thank you for being here and for sharing your comments. Um, always sharing kindness, and I think kindness draws that. So it is no surprise to me, or I'm sure anyone here, that that's why um, that shines around you the way it does. Um, we are a great city. I'm not going to deny that. It's absolute fact. And so are our first responders and public safety. Um, but kindness draws kindness, and that's who you are. Thank you for being here and sharing that. Um, I also want to comment on Bloom 365 that's come up in the last two meetings. Um, again, a fantastic program um, teaching kids how to have healthy relationships and identify the signs of uh, wilting relationships. And my daughter went through the summer camp two summers ago, and I have to tell you that um, you know, she's loved and supported, and, and I'd like to think we have a handle on this, but I, I saw how that changed the course of her life forever, how she approaches and manages relationships with her peers, um, how she will approach when the time comes that she's dating. Um, it will help her in so many ways, personally and professionally. It was just a great way for her to build a foundation and learn lessons and apply them from someone other than her parents. So it was absolutely a program worth experiencing and worth putting the time into. Um, also, my deepest condolences to um, Rosie Strange. Uh, she lost her husband, Chuck Strange. And for those of you that have been around the city for a long time, Chuck Strange has, you know, he's a veteran. He is, has a servant heart. He was a champion for Peoria. I worked many special events for him. He's, he volunteered with the Diamond Club. He volunteered with the Chamber of Commerce. Um, he was always there. He was always looking at how to, how to, how to, and getting things done. Huge loss. May he rest in peace. I, I know he's in a better place, and my life is better for having known him. Thank you. Thank you for those kind words. Council Member Patena. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> On uh, Saturday, February 8th, I attended a, a park fest at the Vistas Recreation Center in Westbrook Village. Um, it was a little different event. I've said many times how much I enjoy park fests. I'd say from beginning to end, we probably had 100 people come through. Uh, they had a classic rock band that the mayor found for us. They were really great. A lot of compliments on them. Uh, we had burgers and ice cream, and it was uh, a lot of fun. It was from 2 to 5, and I hope to do that uh, again. I have some uh, information on upcoming events. Uh, tomorrow, Wednesday, February 19th, for those of you who know me, You'll happy, be happy for me that the Desert Diamond Casino is opening, <laughs> and I'm going to be there along with uh, the mayor and uh, Council Member Edwards. It's, uh, uh, we're, we're actually going for the ribbon cutting. Um, on February <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> on February 21st, uh, there's a homeless outreach event at Rio Vista. We have about three of those a year. This is truly an amazing event. Uh, when it first started, we had a few homeless people coming out of the riverbed and wanting to help get services. And now we get you know, 60, 70 men and women showing up. Um, they have a truck that provides showers. They have people in there that give haircuts. And if, if you were able to see the transformation from somebody coming out of a riverbed, getting a haircut, getting a shower, getting some new clothes, it's, it's really quite amazing. They also provide food, water, hygiene kits, uh, pet exams, vaccines, vouchers, access registration, veteran, veteran benefits, behavioral health, and a number of other things. I'd say there's well over 20 uh, organizations that show up for that, and uh, it's, uh, it's quite extraordinary. Um, on February 22nd, <clears throat> I hope everyone can attend. The spring training begins. That's hard to believe. It seems like the season just ended, but... Uh, it means a great deal to the P83 area. Uh, people shop, people eat food. Uh, it just makes them aware of what's going on in P83. And uh, I know there's 178 other events that go on there during the year, but uh, 
I think uh, spring training probably garners the most people in, in any given time. Uh, on Sunday, February 23rd, the Westbrook Village Veterans Annual Car Show is from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, it's at 18827 Country, uh, 18827 Country Club Parkway by the Fire and Arts Learning Center. They get about 50 or 60 cars. Uh, it's, uh, it's fun to walk around, and I think the fundraiser for them is you can buy hamburgers or hot dogs there, and I think that's how they make some, some of their uh, money. On Monday the 24th, there's a Veterans Resource uh, Seminar. It's Chris Hallett's group and Karen Imig's group. Uh, they're going to be at uh, Rio Vista. Uh, it's just another service that we're providing to our veterans. Uh, so if they're going to start a business, you can come there, financing your business, SBA loans, growing your business, contracting opportunities, a number of opportunities for our veterans to, uh, to start their, their own business. On Saturday, February 29th, the Northwest Valley Lions Club Pancake Breakfast is at the Lynx Restaurant. Again, that's in Westbrook Village. It's from Saturday, February 29th from 8 a.m. till 10.30 at the Lynx Grill. Um, advanced tickets are $8.00 or $10 at the door, and a portion of the proceeds go to the Northwest Valley Lions Club in support of their vision and their hearing programs. They do a wonderful job, so if you have a chance, uh, try to support them. And then on Saturday, February 29th, uh, myself along with uh, some other council members are gonna go to Deep Within Recovery. Uh, that's a substance abuse organization located on 91st Avenue in, in Grand. Um, they do excellent work. They've been in business several years, and they're gonna they're actually in the middle of a capital campaign uh, to try to earn money so they can actually buy the property from the landlord. And uh, we're going to be there to try to kick off that, uh, that open house. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Youth Council Liaison Great House. <laughs> um, about two weeks ago, I was invited to a Heart for the City fundraiser. Um, this was such a great organization. There were a lot of speakers. There were four students who were in this program who spoke. And they were very passionate about the impact it's had on them, and it was very moving. I'm really glad I attended. Um, last week at the Youth Advisory Board meeting, st um, STAND, which stands for um, <laughs> Students Taking a New Direction, presented an anti-tobacco campaign. Um, there was discussion on starting possible signage at different parks around the city, and we'll be continuing our work with them. And lastly, I just want to congratulate the winners of the constitutional contest. I got to view some of the art and read some of the essays, and they were really great, and I'm really impressed. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to both of our Youth Council liaisons for your role in presenting all of those winners for the, the Constitution Contest this evening. You did a great job. And with that, we are adjourned.